Hello, hello, and welcome to Homeboy. <laughs> It says comedy, low honk, which I thought suited you pretty well. So. Literally, uh, the Helsinki couldn't cope with the tempo we played. <laughs> suddenly pretend we're all pals. We're not going to be skipping up the Gorgi Road, holding hands with hat slams or nothing. Like Welcome to the Homeboys Live phone in show, show number 59. So we keep trundling forward, trying to entertain the Celtic masses. This week, uh, we're not joined by Paul Largan or David Harper at this moment. Paul Largan's having a break tonight. Uh, we, I'm joined by Jason Higgins, as usual. Hell, hell. And filling the spot of Paul Largan is the one and only Vince the Pirate. Go ahead there, Stephen. Hell, hell. Uh, I am, of course, Joe McKenna. Sorry, a, a little plastic head just fell off my table there. Um... David Harper's going to be joining us in about 10 minutes. He's, uh, I don't know what he's doing. He's pretty drunk. Um, so we are going to try and raise your spirits here tonight after the uh, bad result on Saturday. And we have uh, on the line Stephen, who was actually at the game. So we're just going to do what we usually do and throw it over to one person and then see where the conversation goes as we snowball. We are, of course, on Skype. Uh, search Homeboys on Skype. That's Homeboys, one word, with a capital H and a capital B. Um, so any point you want to Skype in, talk to us, if you have any opinions, anything you want to bring up, we're here to listen, we're here to chat, and uh, don't don't be afraid to just come in. What we usually do is just join you into the conversation without really saying anything, and then eventually try to bring you in. So first things first, we're going to throw it over to uh, Stephen to tell us his take on the match, because as you know, things can be different when you're there, as when you're watching the TV or whatever. So Stephen, take it away. Um, what was your overall take on the game when you walked out? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll start off with, I went up on the supporters bus again. The, the day started off fantastic. Uh, there was a little farmer's market where the bus set off. I got our own organic square sausage for a barbecue. South Glasgow, 9.30, was great. Um, the bus was late. We had a bus driver who didn't like the motorway, so we just made it to the ground on time. Um, getting up to Perth, there was a lady who was a passenger who looked like the, a female Where's Wally who decided to give the guys in the bus the finger. Um, she opened her mouth, she had green teeth. So everybody <laughs> started waving at her, you know, there was no malice or no chanting at her. And a free pal slid down the seats. Um, the, the game itself, I think the difference on Saturday was you were looking at a team who were fine to keep their manager in a job. And you, our team were probably fingers off the buzz, thinking just about the Benfica game on Wednesday night. Um, I enjoyed seeing Miku coming on for his interaction in the game, but 
I mean, my main point has been, as I, as I said off earlier, I mean, the, the show you guys did on uh, Friday night was fantastic with the Scouts gentleman, Eddie. I really enjoyed it. And at the start of the second half, the Celtic fans, in the, the, the main East stand that we had in our little stand, we started the tan just as for the 96. Um, there was no interaction whatsoever from the St. Johnson fans over this. They just sat very static. Uh, afterwards, I was invited after the game, well, before the game, by my mate who's a St. Johnston season ticket holder and they'd put me on the Facebook page for the match. So after the game I went on and I said, do you know what, fair dues, better team won you, we're more hungry on it. I says, but we're all football fans at the end of the day and I was quite disappointed with your interaction on the Justice for the 96 comments. Um, I get the replies back that they couldn't hear us and it was because the two stands didn't sing at once and the other one was is that they couldn't make their accents out. <laughs> What if they want somebody to bring a big metronome? Uh, hey, everybody together, let's go. Well, to be fair, there was a flag as well saying justice for the 96, so... <laughs> one of them came out and said that we, we did see a banner at half-time. Um, I don't know how well it came out in, uh, on the television, but as I say, I was quite aggrieved about it, and then I don't know if they thought I was like, a renegade fan, because I mentioned my pal Stuart saying, listen, Stuart knows me well, been to games with him hundreds of times, I'm not having a dig about it. And one fan said they actually sang it, but nobody else in their stand sang about it. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, apart from that, it's you, you can take for the game what you want. I mean, we come down the road afterwards. It's it's all working class guys in the bus, and there's a bo- four boys looking for four tickets to go to Moscow. You know, I, I, I mean, I don't want to slag any of the players off. I mean, I thought Brown was very good. I enjoyed Scott Brown's performance. I didn't think Kelvin Wilson was too bad. I thought Kelvin Wilson was alright too. I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed uh, Miku, as I said. Other big new lad came on, he did okay, but, but there were certain players, um, I, I think guys like Charlie Mulgrew, who's a fantastic player, but his concentration levels have got to be 100% all the time. The minute he's not playing 100%, that's when we hit problems. But the, the referee didn't do us any favours. We get kicked to bits, but we're going to get that this season. Yep, and then the penalty decision as well. We don't want to have point about that, but yeah. my God almighty, what a stone baller when Commons get pulled in. No, you know, but, a, a red card you, as well. Like. That's a red card and you've got a penalty, potentially 2-1 up there down to 10 men, but ach, well, that, I, I was just gutted. The only other thing I'd, I'd say on it, I mean, I sat yesterday watching all the foreign on ESPN, and I mean, obviously the, the shite hawks from Madrid uh, and the team who won Serie A last year, who I can't remember, I think it was Juventus. Both of them are having sort of struggling as well at the start of the season. So, I mean, your bigger teams are... I mean, I know it's Celtic. I think I heard somebody in the shop today saying it was Celtic's first start since 92. I don't know how true that is, but I think the priority is is that we're now on Wednesday night, Be for me, is it? But I think hopefully... I'll take... The only positive I'll take is is that if we get beat on Saturday, if we'd won on Saturday, the players might have been in a bit easy ozy about Wednesday night, but hopefully Lennon's put a rock up their ass and we'll see who actually makes the start in a living on Wednesday night because nobody's got a God given right to walk into that team. Mm. No, I would agree. Uh, that's that's one positive I was taking it as well. But when you actually analyse it all, see if you take it right back to the start of the season before a ball's kicked, with a bit of hand off, you'd be sitting in this position just now. You know, a few points off the lead of the Scottish Premier League, but about to start our first Champions League game. You know, that's where our priorities were at the start of the season. But you still can't take your finger off the pulse. And the way this team is at the minute, they're sort of taking it like a God-given right that they're going to win this league. And that's sort of the way they're, they look as if they're approaching these games. And it just isn't going to work with that. To me, the best performance we've had this season in the Premier League has been when we played our so-called second string against Inverness. I thought that was the best uh, the team's performed this season. I thought our big players on Saturday, and to me, three of our best players, our best player to me is Wanyama, but three of our best players, Wanyama, Forrest and Hooper, they weren't at the races. OK, Hooper played the ball across to Commons for his goal. And uh, it, was, it was a good goal for Commons, good strike, but their goal they could have done better. It wasn't yeah. even in the corner of the net or anything, but delighted to get that start. And then, well, we could have had a penalty at one each. But apart from that, we didn't have uh, many clear-cut chances. Uh, we had a few, sorry, half chances, a few scrambles in the box and things like that. But I just think too many people were off their game and were missing guys like uh, Joe Ledley and Sammy. I was going to break but, up Joe Ledley and say I think that I was, he wouldn't have changed the game, I don't think, on Saturday. But, you know, 
his industry in midfield certainly was missing, you know. Ah, he's he's unsung hero, you know. He's 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 doing the job that you, he doesn't get credit for, you know. He's the part of the engine room that's making it tick, sort of thing. And I think you win games and lose games for the midfield, you know. They they've got a support of defence and the forward line, and it just wasn't happening for us. But a big disappointment for me is as a Geary. I'm just getting to the stage now that he's he's just an ordinary player now. Yeah, he's just ordinary at best. He's I don't know if he'll ever. I'm just worried now he'll, he'll never get back to the standards that he set when he first came. But do you reckon, maybe, he's, do you reckon maybe he's suffering from the Lee Naylor curse? One season he's fantastic, and next season he's gash? I, I, but Lee Naylor didn't have an injury like him. You know, that's I, true, yeah. That's the... I don't know if he, he doesn't even do the overlapping runs now. When was the last time he put a cross ball in the box? Well, the only, the, the only, the only player we're seeing doing that is Matthews. You know what I mean? See... But Stephen mentioned it as well about Charlie Mulgrew and our defence. I just think, okay, big Kelvin Wilson isn't bad, but I don't think we've got we've got a decent defender at a lot of them. I think Charlie Mulgrew is great going forward, and he's what a culture left foot he's got on him. He's delivering into the box. He's a great option attacking the box as well. But defensively, I don't think he's got the mindset of a defender. And I think their first goal, I mean, the gap we had between uh, Azagiri at left back and Mulgrew, but. Is that because Kelvin Wilson and Lustig's out of position? You know, I don't know, because I've seen Brown tracking back and Lustig sort of jogging back. So if you've got your two centre-halves and your full-backs aren't in the correct position, then your centre-halves are getting dragged left and right accordingly. But the defence is... Oh, it's manic at the minute. What about... Seen that, that the new boy's just been given clearance. He's been granted a work permit. Somebody put that on Twitter about 20 minutes ago, so... Big Effie. That... Yeah, I hope that'll make a difference. What's the yeah. what's the verdict on Lustig? Because I I I kind of neither here nor there at the minute on him. I'm the same. I, mean, I what, just I, sometimes I, I, I think he looks a okay. defender between them all. I don't think he's a, he's a he's not like a dominant style player. You know when we had guys like Bobo Baldy or even going back to guys like um, Paul Ely, You know they, they made the presence. They made the presence felt in the game. But yeah. I mean, apart from me, Albi, it's very hard to get a Scandinavian player who really puts the dig in sort of thing, you know, without being dirty. I, I, I just think if we'd one great defender, he could make the rest of them good. But we've got a pile of much of muchness. And I don't want to take away from Charlie Mulgrew, because Charlie Mulgrew is an integral part of our team. But where do we play him with this discussion? Uh, me and Harper spoke about this at the weekend. Is it left back? I don't even think he's that good a left back. Is it left midfield? Where do you play Commons? I don't know. Uh, I just don't think he's a great defender. I think he's okay, and I think the lot of them are okay. I just think, but they're not great. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being a bit overcritical. But no, I just well, see, think it's, defense. I think it's one of those things for years that's constantly bothering us, like def- defenders. You know what I mean? Like when, when you think you have a good lineup, you go, right, that back four is not bad. They're not too, they're not brilliant. But they're not like leaking goals all, the, all. But then the back four itself, they constantly like, they ebb and flow. One week it's great, next week it could be, eh, you know what I mean? And th- there's never been a real solid combination. Not in a few years, I don't think. I think it's as you guys just mentioned there. I think it's highlighted when somebody like Joe Ledley's not there to cut the balls out that they're getting caught out with. If yeah. Ledley's stopping the runs and stopping the players running through, they can sit back and relax a bit. But as you say, I mean, hopefully, I mean, I know Graham for beyond the waves highlights. Ambrose, so hopefully he'll come on here. The only, the only criticism I, got, I would make of the players having a few days break was seeing um, Chris Commons and Gary Hooper playing golf in Dubai. Did they really went to play golf? They were out playing golf in Dubai for a few days, which, OK, you can get an Emirates flight seven and a half hours direct, probably cost you 900 quid. Coming back, you get a free limo and they drop you off via bag at the door. But, you know, I mean, we're critical of Celtic going to America, Philadelphia, which is maybe a seven-hour flight if they get the direct one. So, for having a few days off, jumping seven hours either way. I mean, I know it didn't affect Commons' performance. He was alert during the game. But, I mean, I don't know. Hooper, to me, probably looked probably by the ball to me. And I'm not the skinniest guy. That strip didn't do him any favours on Saturday. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's, he's not performed really at all this season, as far as I'm concerned. Because I, I do rate the guy. I think he's top class. I, I think him and I thought we Forrest was extremely poor. Maybe the international break had a bearing on it, but I thought we Forrest didn't do much at all. But I think it's just a bad day at the office. And Neil Lennon said all the right things after the game, so he was fizzing and rightly so. 
but I think a lot of them uh, were thinking about the Champions League game, and you because. Neil Lennon cracked up, you know, he said to the, he said, if I hear this Champions League one more time, you could see it was doing his boxing. Yeah. But you need to be professional and we've got a league to win here and I just think they've sort of took their eye off the ball and they maybe think it's going to be easy, but it's obviously proven not to be. And a lot of teams aren't frightened of us because they're seeing, that, and no matter how much we build this team up, we said last season, they aren't a great side. They're good and if they all play well on their day, they're pretty good, but I don't think we're a great side at all. We're, we're a decent team, but we've got a, a, a good nucleus, a right good young team that's potentially, if they stay together for a few years, they could be excellent. But we're in this Champions League and we're going to give it a go and I can't wait to Wednesday night starts. I don't want to be overly negative. No, no. It was a ba- bad day at the office, but I can't wait for Wednesday but night. in fairness, I have to say, St. John's were well worth their points, like. Aye, and that's, that's the thing. I mean, see both their goals. The first guy, goal they took it brilliant. The second yeah. goal was a peach. Was a can, we actually, can we actually blame Lustig? We're saying they should have showed him outside and stuff like that. But the guy's done just a wee tiny jink with his right foot and he's curled that into the back of the post. Absolutely brilliant. We've been joined by the uh, one and only Reverend Harper. You there? All right, man. You all right, Dad? Nice. Well, I was just uh, eating my dinner, man. I was running, running late. Vicky was away all day, and I had to get loads of stuff done. So there you go. Dustin, you had to get the house dusted. You were going to get spanked. <laughs> That's about. I've never even got that done. So there's a spanking coming later. Happy to <laughs> spank me, spank me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not spanking, alright. What's your? Uh, you you were uh, disgusted on Saturday, Harper. You sent me a couple of messages. Uh, what's what's your take on? It? We don't want to be doom and gloom here. We want to move on to. Talking about Benfica and uh, the Champions League, but uh, we'll give you a say on uh, on Saturday. So far away. I was listening. I was listening to you there, like, and uh, and Stephen brought brought up a very good point that although Ledley is, Ledley is, is that you, Harper? What have you done? You all right? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, it was all going well now. What's happened? I don't know. But it, was, it was going well till he called in. That better. That's better, eh? Uh, I never had headphones on. Oh, okay. Forgot. Um, no, Stephen said about Joel Edley, who's um, he's not the most dynamic player that stands out, but he does protect the defence. Um, Scott Brown didn't have his best game at the weekend, I didn't think, because, as and a, lot of, a lot of people have been saying it, he gets caught out of position when he's playing in the middle of the park, partly because I think he tries to do too much. When other players are performing, he's... Listen, if we win, people after the game are saying, ah, Scott Brown was brilliant, he covered every blade of grass in the park. If we didn't win, Scott Brown was caught out of position too much. And I tend to agree that he was caught out of position too much. And by that, the defence wasn't getting any protection. And I think sometimes we're just showing up a bit easily. Without the without the defence getting the protection, I kind of agree with Jason. It's a real. What do we do with Charlie Mulgrew? Like? Because the alarm bells were ringing for me away in Helsinki when he kept losing possession, getting caught in the ball. But he is he's the kind of player that when he's on his game that we'll need in Europe because he's the need you need to keep the ball in Europe. You need your footballers to to play football if you like. But man, you could see him really getting shown up a top-class centre-forward, so I don't know. Um, Lustig, I thought Lustig was, had a lot of fair criticism at the weekend. I thought he was probably one of our better players, especially in the first half. Anything that we really did, attack-wise, came came through him. And he was caught at the back a few times, but when you've got full-backs playing that way, that's, that's got to happen. Like, it's good to be expected. I mean, that's what we expect for Ezeguiri. It's just not happening for him at all. Like, uh, Patience is running out with Zagiri, and I, I, what I mean by that is you can't just keep going trundling on, hoping it's going to, going to come together for the boy because it might not. So, and the same goes for Gary Hooper, to be honest. Like, you can't just keep putting these performances in week in, week out, and expect to be in the start of the especially when all the squad are size. Uh, especially when somebody like Tony Watt, even though he should have scored at the end, he still came on and it was a breath of fresh air in the team, and he's showing up his strike partner for uh, commitment and work rate. So I don't know. There's a lot to there's a lot to be to be done here in the in the SPL. Would you play Tony Watt before Hooper? <clears throat> um 
I said that I kind of hinted towards that at the end of the game on Saturday, although I was probably just more annoyed uh, the frame of mind I was in, um, because you ask yourself, like, does Gary Hooper deserve to start against Benfica Wednesday night? Well, with hindsight, he probably does because of what he's given to the club since he came to the club. But if you were to speak on recent performances, you would have to say, no, if there's a better option. And I, I, have, I would have no fear of flinging Tony Watt in as a raw 18-year-old. I would have absolutely no fear. I, I think he has the game in him. Um, I don't think it would worry him too much. I don't think he'd be phased by it at all. Um, and Jason said a few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, that Europe's been the making of some young boys in the past. Just throw them in, man. Throw them in and see what they can do. We're not talking about flinging a whole team of youngsters in here. Tony Watt, Something special, but um, um, I don't know if he could lead. See, we're probably going to play one man up front, and that's the only thing. It'd probably be a bit too much for the boy to go in there to be the lone striker. So that that would be my only kind of fear in that. But if we were to play a four-four-two, um, I would certainly see Tony Watt start before Miku, because that boy, uh, that was another thing that was driving me nuts. Uh, I made the mistake of putting Twitter on at half time at the weekend and they were all wanting Miku shipped back to La Liga after four five minutes now. <laughs> Listen, the boy the boy wasn't great, but he wasn't that bad either. He looked he alright. I mean for for the limited he, yes. he made a couple of decent runs. Uh, he well, honestly he just looked off the pace more than anything. Aye. The one the one the one chance he had the snapshot he hit sort of high and wide. But I just thought the couple of touches they had it didn't look too bad. But he he's a player. You yeah. know, there, 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 there's no doubt about it. He's, he's played in La Liga. Yeah. But you see, know, he's, he's a player. Yes, and see the thing for me, him starting at the weekend, I think that was in two minds to see where he was um, fitness-wise, if he would be up to speed for the pace of the game. Uh, we had an eye on Wednesday night to see if he was going to be an option. And I, think, I just think now... Uh, he just looked completely off the pace to me. Like he, he just did. He, he looked to me, but yeah. But do you not think with the rest, so many players underperforming that that wasn't a great match to gauge him on? Like, oh, and I, no. I th- well, what I would say here, Harper, is off the pace in an SPL game is different from off the pace in a Champions League game against Benfica. He would be on the pace more than anybody else in our team. Ah, see, but, but even when Lasalle play, come he on, he plays in that type of game. Even when Lasalle come on, I thought like I mean the, the two of them kind of. He had a couple of touches that made me look like he, he likes to have time on the ball. And he, he's just going to have to realise quickly, you don't get that in Scottish football, you know? I think maybe Miku's guilty of that as well. But in the Champions League, it's different, you know? What I was trying to say was that I think he was given his opportunity on Saturday to show that he was to be the first to, to start Wednesday night. And I don't think he took that opportunity. And not because he's a ability or anything like that. I just think he's just not ready. He's just not ready. And for me, if we're playing 4-4-2... That Miku's performance on Saturday would not keep Tony Watt in the team for me. Tony Watt would be starting 100% for yeah. him. That's, that's, well, that's kind of, I thought Neil Lennon was basically hoping to keep Miku. It wasn't, a, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, what, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't a slur, if you like, on Tony Watt that he was dropped or put on the bench for Miku. I think it was more a chance of, well, let's, is this going to be the guy for Wednesday night? Let's have a look at him. And for me, I think Tony Watt will be the guy on Wednesday night if we're playing that four four two formation. But it just all depends on who's all fit and stuff like that. Neil Lennon was saying there today or yesterday, that, well, I think it was on his Facebook page, that um, he's, he's basically got a full squad to pick from. But we're standing like the long-term injuries to Stokes and Sam Rass and stuff like that, Ledley and all that. Like the guys are just me niggles now. It's Kai Allen. Kai Allen, but I, so what, I'm, what I think is, what I mean is, I, I, we'll probably just play Hooper up front with Chris Commons or James Forrest playing off from that. That would be the team, so we'll probably have a place for Miku or Tony Watt, to be honest with you. Well, well if, you're, if you're playing that, we could put Charlie McGrew in the midfield, as we were talking. But yeah. I, don't, I don't think he'll do it. Where do you put one Yama then? Well, he's going to play in the centre of mid, but he was he didn't even turn up so hard, but he's, qu- he's quality. But I did. Do you think it was true, Neil, when Neil Lennon said that most some of them had their minds in the Champions League? Um, definitely. Yeah, you're only human, man. They're only young guys, and definitely, I mean, the majority of Scott Brown. I think it was said Scott, Scott Brown's only player that's played in the Champions League group stages. So, a lot of these guys, that's why we kept myself to, to play in the Champions League. But 
it's kind of it's, it's two sides of one coin. It's like, well, they didn't want to get hurt, they didn't want to get injured, stuff like that. They want to play the Champions League, but at the end of the day, they've got to play for that position to play in the Champions League. So I don't know. I just it was just a very disappointing, just a disappointing performance at the weekend. Uh, but to be honest, it's not it's not just like many performances we got away from home last season. Um, I think we get carried away at times with the quality of this team sometimes. Uh, which is still a young team and they're still very much learning. But we've got to be better at that. The thing is, the most disappointing thing I think for the majority of people was we didn't seem to match um, our opponent's commitment in the game. And that that's unforgivable. That's the one thing that's unforgivable. We've got to show the same energy levels and the same commitment levels as your opponent, especially in Scotland, because that's a great level, right? Um, uh, but just didn't do that. And I don't know, I didn't, I didn't buy into this. Uh, people, because they know there's no Rangers in the league and stuff like that, I didn't think that goes through their minds. But definitely one eye on the Champions League game uh, definitely could be a, could be a factor, I'd say. No, I, I kind of disagree, Harper. I think they have got, they've got into this mindset that they'll win the league and it's only a case of turning up. I just, I genuinely believe a lot of the players think that. Hence, our substandard performances for the start of the season. I do. I think if Rangers were still in the league, if they were still a team competing against us, they guys would have been given a lot more. Yeah, well, if if, if, they, if, if that's their attitude, they're just going. What they're going to get is just team after team turning up to do them. Yeah, right. I think that. I, listen, I think I seem to be saying the same same thing about the same players for the tail end of last season as well. Like they've not kicked on as we said. For when we said in the very first podcast this season after the first game and we're worried about the performance and stuff like that and the biggest worry I think myself to Paul Arthur says we didn't seem we didn't even look like we've moved on for the last we just seem we're stupid so and at the minute that's exactly what it is we didn't seem we've kicked on at all from last season the performances are pretty much just the same do you guys don't think as a I mean I work with a lot of English guys and I used to say to them when they, when they slag their league off, I think you've got to look at the fact that maybe teams like Liverpool, Manchester United, but your bigger teams would go to play teams like Wimbledon. I try and explain that Celtic going to play these teams, it's like playing Wimbledon. We are now the only big show in town. So every player's got to measure their season against playing us. And I don't think we are players, as you rightly say, Wednesday night, OK, they're more up for the game, but it, it's, no much, uh, it's no much help for the guys that are going up in the States at five in the morning to watch the game or the guys going to the game sort of thing, you know, that there's a, a lot, I mean, as I say, I'll try and take the positive of it getting gubbed on Saturday and the fact it'll put a rocket up their ass. But to me, I don't know if you guys know yet, if um, Lucio, the defender, was supposed to be have a two-month suspension. I don't know if um, Benfica's going to appeal that. What was the suspension for? Um, he, he gets sent off for pushing a player or uh, pushing the referee over the Canio style. Fantastic. And season friendly. On a friendly? On a friendly, aye. Um, it, was, uh, it was on Twitter last week and it was saying that they've still not appealed it yet. So I don't know if it's mind games they'll do it at the last minute appeal it so he can play on Wednesday night. But I mean, he's their main centre half day, but I believe. So it'd be interesting to see what happens there. Can I just say there on the, the Ev- Everton Newcastle game there, emotional stuff there. Before the game started, uh, the two mascots, a wee guy and a wee girl, with an Everton and a Liverpool shirt on. One had nine in the back of their shirt, the other one had six. Okay. And they've just in the big screen they've put up the '96 folk with uh, a blue nine and a red six, and they're playing a song and the full crowds clapping. It's emotional stuff there. Can you fair play to them? The guy you had on on Friday night, Jason Eddie, is he on Twitter or anything like that? I don't think so, mate. I'll ask him. I doubt it, but he told Technophobe it was his son that <laughs> got, him, got him on Skype and everything. I think at the start <laughs> of the show, I, I don't think he really knew what he was on. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, later in the show, but, but I, I really enjoyed that show. I thought it was really, really good. I mean, I yeah. watched, um, yeah. he, honestly, I, mean, I can't, I can't uh, thank he's enough for the show. I mean, I watched the Liverpool TV thing all day. I get it free, but the point Eddie brought up about the uh, the six police officers meeting for lunch a few days after it to get their story covered, you know, I, I didn't hear that in, any, in anywhere else, you know. Ach, it was just an emotional thing altogether, the whole talking to Eddie about it and things like that. I mean, obviously, I, I spoke to him a good couple of times before he came on to do the show. 
some of the stuff he was telling us, I didn't realise as well that the, the actual families are going to get told this week who the 41 were that uh, could have survived if they'd get the right medical treatment. I wasn't aware of that until, until he said that in the show. That's just heartbreaking. Like. I mean, you see, I don't know. Would you actually want to know? No. I don't think I would. Well, maybe, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I know. It's just, it's heartbreaking, so it is. And just their thoughts get to them all. And I hope they get their justice. But as he says, he still feels that the top brass will wriggle away for this again. Aye, that's, that's, that's so disappointing. Like, and, and, and the wake of something like that, to still have that lingering doubt of going, listen, this might not, this might not come to the conclusion we want. Yeah, it shows you as well, I know that's sort of unrelated, but the English Premiership, best league in the world and that, so they say. But there it shows you the Newcastle support. And uh, they, get, they get a corner of the, the Bullens Road stand, the bottom and the top. They've not even got MD in the top section yet. So Newcastle's, they would have had about, I'd say, 2,600 or 2,700 tickets. And I think they've only sold about 1,000. So that's the greatest league in the world where fans like Newcastle, greatest fans in the world and stuff like that. But uh, there you go. No English yeah. Premiership. If I can just jump in there before you get back to Celtic. Um, I, I just had to nip it the room there for a minute. Um, <laughs> just uh, anybody who's listening, the... The Homeboys Extra Show Friday night was absolutely, it was a phenomenal listen, very um, emotional listen. I really enjoyed it and probably enjoyed it, it's the wrong word to use because you, you're like, I shouldn't be saying that it was an entertaining, because it wasn't there to be entertaining, but it was there to be educational, I suppose, more than anything else. Uh, and it was educational. I thought Eddie was absolutely, absolutely brilliant for a guy who uh, obviously never done anything like that before. Uh, and I'm actually, uh, I was delighted, it sounds silly to say as well, but I was delighted that I, I wasn't involved because um, I think I got a lot more from it just sitting back, kicking back, listening, once it was uploaded. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. I thought the, the three of you uh, should be commended for the way you've handled it. He's, he's done the, the show really well, so no, uh, hat, my, hat off, my hat off to you. And okay. uh, just anybody who's listening, if, you never, if you're listening in the night and you never got that downloaded or anything like that, you look for the whole point. Yeah, one nil Everton. <laughs> oh no! Offside. Ah, offside. Damn. Ah, there you go. Yeah, I've had just done this. I need it with a pose. I need a lot of your big hand. Wait, can we move on to Ben Figa? Yeah. Are we done? Are we done now? Is Johnson? Are we, are we over that hump? Are we finished? That's take. Well, it's on our chins, and we can move on. Just uh, what? What did you think? Uh, um, the new boy when he came on. I thought I thought he 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 looked like he had, he had, a, he had quite a bit of bum, bit of pace going on the left hand side, a few nice touches like that. I thought he would he would decently. The chin isn't. Lassad. Lassad. Uh, is it, how do you say his name? Is it Lassad Wee Wee? Lassad and Wee Wee or something like that. And Wee Wee. That's a that's a that's an unfortunate name. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought he looked all right, but I mean, it's, it's again, he's one of those European guys who comes from places like Spain, playing European football and. It's it's when you're going to somewhere like Perth and you've come from where well, you can't give him Getafe. No, he wasn't Getafe, was he? Um, oh, I think so. Okay, so he's playing. He's playing the Spanish well, league and he's like, like I said, Moroccan, what, isn't he? Uh, he's Tunisian, 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 North African. Yeah. And, like, and like I said earlier, the because players in the Spanish league they, they tend to want a lot of time in the ball. And when you're playing against Johnson, there just there was a point there where we had the ball and he was trying to do something with it, and three players just came around and just hacked it away from him. I mean. And he didn't get any, any time. I think it's just going to take a while for someone like him. He looked big and strong. He looked like he had the right ideas, but, you know, time will tell. Do you know, do you know what I always think? It's harder. It's always harder for a Celtic player. Probably. This is the same for It's going to sound stupid again. Probably the same for any player in any team. But I think it's always much easier for a Celtic player to make his debut at Celtic Park. Do you know what I mean? Um, one, one of these wee tight pitches where a team's in your face all the time probably isn't the best place to make your Celtic debut. So Miku would have suffered a wee bit for that in the first half as well. Um, but uh, listen, I, I thought the two boys, I, they, they both look like they've got something about them and they'll definitely add to their team. I've no worries about that at all. Hopefully, just look, I really, really look forward to seeing the big defender, big Ambrose or Ambrose, I'm not sure about pronunciation yet, but I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> Ambrose, he's big pudding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You've got that written in front of you in big letters to remind you to say it. <laughs> when I said the F earlier on, it's probably like, damn, I'll get it later on the show. <laughs> I just started, though, did you see Big Bangura's goal yesterday, the sheriff? I haven't seen I haven't seen the video, it was it good? Oh, I tell you what, 
Van Vasken is we know we're Paul 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 was devastated when he left I thought that he calls up the sheriff for blazing saddles. <laughs> 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 He says he'll come back. And, he'll come back and shut up all those non-believers. He still thinks he's going to be a fairly a season man for Sally. I'm going to sit this all season. Wait for the panel. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you should just fly away. Obligation. <laughs> trust me. I tried to slaughter me. Right. Just, Let's move on to Ben Fager. Right, will we just go for teams? We'll get, let you said, Harper. Who would you play on, on Wednesday night? <clears throat> um, oh, Jesus. Um, I'm presuming Adam Matthews is back, so... Hopefully. Probably the Adam Matthews and from Lustig. Probably Ben Lustig. I'd stick with Zagiri at left back. Um... I don't like. I don't. I know Adam Matthews could come in and play left back, and Lustig could play right back, and Matthews is, is okay at left back. But I prefer a, I prefer a left back at left back if you know what I mean by that. Yeah. Proper left back. As a gear, as a gear, he's still the best option. Um, I'd probably stick with Mulgrew and Wilson in, in the centre defence. I think we'll probably have the extra midfield man. Maybe he'll drop to the bench, so we'll probably get the protection. Um, for the defence that they've never had at the end of the weekend. So Wanyama will probably just play in front of the back four and show them that up a wee bit. And then you'll have a midfield, uh, I think, Forrest, Collins, uh, Scott Brown, Cooper up front. Who's, who, who am I missing in the midfield? Who's, who else is going to play in the midfield? So that's the thing. Yeah, you got, it's going to be Wanyama. You're saying you're putting Wanyama behind the midfield, but... Yeah, I'm five, but trust me. Do you know what I mean? I'm going well, like Commons and Forrest are going to they're going to swap support Hooper to the left and the right. Um, so I'm well, you're, three. well, you're, well you're, you've only got Twarzek sort of thing because you're that's, you're missing uh, you're missing Kai Al, you're missing Ledley. You're playing um, Commons behind the. Well, I'll tell you if I'm Hooper. playing Scott Brown in there and I'm playing my Yama protective defence, and this will not be a popular uh, certainly across the, the the border there in County Dublin. But if you're giving me the choice of who who we've got left, I'm, uh, I'm going to put Paddy in the court in there. On, on Wednesday night against Benfica? Uh, would rather than Fort Torza, yes. Why no? Uh, Paddy, uh, see, Paddy, see Paddy McCourt? Paddy McCourt could run riot against these teams, I'm Jason, sure. Jason, see the thing is as well, we, we, we have to think about, and as I said at the start, at the top of the show, about how Charlie Mulgrew can hold on to the ball, right? Paddy McCoke's another guy who can hold on to the ball. Maybe sometimes he plays deep when the passes are on the sideways and stuff like that. And that's what you need in Europe sometimes. You've got to keep possession. Chasing shadows is no good at that level. You've got to keep possession. And I think uh, the Commons and Forrest attacking on the, the, the wide, wide, I think Paddy McCoke could hold ball and good distribution to the, to the middle of the park. Well, the best we've played all season was Inverness away for me. And it was Paddy and Twarzik in the middle of the park. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's like mind we striking used to always he used to always throw one and you turn up to the European nights and there'd be somebody playing you like, what's he what's the, what happening with this team? Lennon kinda of does it at times as well, you know, he puts in something, but you never know, see after that on Saturday, maybe he'll read the right act, maybe a couple of players that thought they were guaranteed starts. Well, Jason, maybe what about, what about um, maybe Thomas Rogney will start and Charlie McGrew will win the midfield. The midfield. The Rogney and Wilson, two centre mm-hmm. halves, and I would I would definitely play Matthews if he was fit. I'd play him at right back in front of Lustig, and I'd play as a Geary at left back. But what do you do? Do you play five in the middle? Do you play three centre backs? No. And no, I don't no. know, play play like I don't know, sort of like Commons, wide right, and as a Geary wide left is sort of attacking full backs. I don't know. No, not for me. No. I don't really like that three centre halves carry on. Like, no, because we've just not got the players are good enough at it. Right. Could, could could we class Benfica as one of as one of the weaker teams in our group? Maybe no. Who knows, mate? It's one of these ones. You you know for a fact they would have, they would take the the tools to absolutely destroy us if everything went right for them because they'll be a class football team. But I also think with the Celtic crowd behind us, and if we play good, they're there for the taking as well. Yeah. 
I wouldn't yeah. see them coming as like a Paris Saint Germain or a Borussia Dortmund or like a Barcelona. No, one a team that you know is going to come and going to run riot. Yeah, I wouldn't see them like that. But they would be more than capable of doing it. But their captain's out, isn't he? He's got a ban for four games in the Champions League. Yeah. And then they've sold two of their top strikers. But we're not a great side. But I just think we've been we've been good in Europe. Mm-hmm. Fingers mm-hmm. crossed. That's, that's a glimmer, isn't it? Because we have been good, good in Europe so far this season, so you, you kind of have to take that positive thing. you got to think of yourself as well, a lot of these young lads that haven't experienced this on a Wednesday night when they're starting there in the lineup and the music's playing, and it's the, oh. it's the real deal, like, what that's going to do to them, you know? There's, 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 no better, there's no better stage in the world than Celtic a Champions League night. And especially at the start, you know, everything's fresh, we're no behind, we're, we're the, the group's level, you know, everybody's got the, the hope... And uh, I can see the place absolutely bouncing Wednesday night, so there's no better stage. And it's, I mean, it's practically sold out. Benfica sent back 380 tickets or something, so they'll, they'll have been snapped up, and I would say so. I think, a few, I, think, I think there's a few tickets left, mate, a few single tickets. Mm-hmm. Uh, Celtic could on their site, there's still a few left tomorrow, but I think it's a few. Right, it's like only in the hundreds, it's not. Yeah. I mean, so it's going to be a selling the atmosphere, is going to be exactly what we're looking for. I've made no doubt about that. Big, the big time is back. Yep. Stephen, do you want to jump in there, mate? Are you there? Did we lose Stephen? I don't know. He's maybe having he's maybe having a lap dance and cheese and toast. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> just keep an eye on his just keep an eye on his blog that he's got up on Wednesday because I had a wee preview today. Schedule for the site. Are you, are you back, <laughs> Stephen? I saw it. He's gone again. Well, he's telling well, he's taking Paul's place. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right, back again. I'm back. <laughs> Hello. Hi. You hear me? Okay. Hi. You just you, you, you keep my getting in and out. My cash and carry lap. <laughs> <laughs> Got my window, man. <laughs> See if you get a better signal. Get the girlfriend out, out, out the door with a wire hanger. Oh, uh, better than that. <laughs> just open right. the back window and get it rocky style. <laughs> I've Rod Holt's phone number here. Reference <laughs> <laughs> the team for Wednesday night. I mean, if you remember when Liam Miller played against Standerlet, oh, he was yes. another oh, player. Class. You know, so I mean, their Benfica's not a daft team. They'll probably get videos and all the select players. As you quite rightly say, throw Twarzik in or throw Paddy McCoat in. We've got to go 4 4 2 and we've got to have a go. But realistically, I know we'll be very good this season away, but we've nothing to lose. I thought Park Heat. For me, Wednesday night for me is when Glasgow as a city realises we're the only show in town. Yeah. The lights are on, the music's playing, and then Govington or Ibrox, whatever you want to call it, we'll all be sitting watching these standards or whatever. You know, this, yes. this, is, this is when the hot starts. I don't give a. I was going to swear that, but when, this is when it's starting to kick in now. Because everybody's up for it, the whole city's buzzing. The mainstream media is no touching it at all. You're only having to get the Twitter feeds for Celtic saying, more tickets, more tickets. I'm getting guys who never go to games phoning me today, can you get hold of a ticket for me, you know? Whenever the, whenever the draw was made, I put a post on Twitter saying, I'm going to make an absolute fortune selling earplugs to Huns in the East End of Glasgow on Champions League night. Don't, listen, don't kid yourselves on that they'll not be watching. Oh, they'll, they'll be watching, watching yes. Standards. They'll be sitting, protect, they'll tell you the next day if we win, they never watch. You better believe they'll be sitting watching, desperate for us to, to fall flat at the first hurdle. I'll tell you something, Jason, I don't know what you think about this, but for me, um, this, the, the game on Wednesday night is for a Champions League kind of hopes. And dreams. Oh, it's, it's, one, it's, it's one of the worst. Aye, because after that, you're away to Moscow and then back to back games against Barcelona. You've got to win that game on Wednesday night if yeah. you, I think if you have any sort of ambition to get into that group. Got well, to win. That's football, football's a funny thing, right? And you, you can never guarantee anything, but I tend to agree. See the way the fixture list came out. It's our, our away game, the one at the three, I would expect us to maybe get something from. I'm not taking anything for granted. I think, I think we'll get in in Moscow. I'd, I, I wouldn't bet anything on it, but it's the one at the three of them. You would mm-hmm. potentially, because I was in Benfica. I was in Lisbon the time we got beat 3 0. I think it was 3 0 after about 12 seconds. So you're, you're looking to yourself saying, we've already we've got a draw in Moscow before. 
We've already won against a Moscovite team, though them obviously. But we drew with them over there. Did we draw? Uh, we, did, we drew with them over there, didn't we? Ah, uh, so Hartley scored. Paul Hartley scored. Aye, Paul Hartley and Scott Brown missed a chance in the last minute. Aye, but uh, aye, get in one nil Everton, late in Baines. But uh, aye, um, oh, it's just the, the way the fixture list come out. That's this is this is us. If we say the first two games, we've lost the two of them. You laugh. <laughs> Bought me the group, but. I think, see, we're sitting with four points. Oh, happy days. You're writing off the two Barca games. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you're expecting beat Moscow at home if you took anything from them over there. And then just, you never, never know in Lisbon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not being negative. I mean, there is a chance we could get, if we play our skins, right, everything falls into place, Celtic Park on a Wednesday night, we can maybe get a draw against Barcelona. Let's we never say never, but to be realistic, you're right. Yeah. You can you can kind of write them off as six points gone, like. Yeah, but but Celtic Celtic at home against yeah. anybody in the world in a yeah. Champions League night. Well, obviously end in Europe, <laughs> but in a Champions League night, uh, yeah. you could you could you wouldn't be surprised if we beat anybody. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're not going to the game against Barcelona expecting to win, yeah. but you wouldn't be overly surprised if we beat anybody. Exactly right. But I just feel with men this team, a lot of things have to go right on the night, if you know what I mean, against that kind of opposition. We I just don't think we've got the players that we had in the past. Like, but no, no, as you say, man, listen, any could have, they could be, listen, we could beat Barcelona home and away and lose all the rest of the games in the group. Oh, I know. Just thought, oh, Celtic, like, do you know what I mean? So I can absolutely, I'm absolutely can't wait. I'm buzzing for, I'm absolutely buzzing for Wednesday night, man. This is what it's all about. Do you not think it's good for the economy as well? Because you're looking at, I mean, Celtic fans and younger Celtic fans who haven't experienced, they're going to enjoy it. But you've got all the old cool fans. I'll, I'll go into town tomorrow for a Mellow Birds and Check. There'll be Greaves, Greaves Sports in the Gordon Street group to buy every strip who we are playing against the Champions League. That's what it usually they enter. They're going to do anything for the economy and rather. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you, see, I, I sort of tend to think different. I don't think they'll watch it. See, but, see, but, see, but, see if it was the aim, I wouldn't watch it. Because I, I did, you know, see, like, I, I found out on Sunday that they drew 0 0 because I'd get no texts at all after the game. Obviously, right. everybody's just sitting with us, but I get no text whatsoever about their result. Nobody even mentioned it in the passing. Jason, I got a, I got a message. My mate Charlie, Joe, you know, Chuck, yes. Charlie, he's, he's over in Texas on holiday at the minute, but his girl, right? Because his girl lives in Texas. So, anyway, um, he sent me a message about 11 o'clock Saturday night. Say, what was the hunt score? I was like, no, a clue, man. <laughs> I, have to go and look. I had to go on the Sky Sports app and look up. I knew it was nil nil at half time because I'd seen it on the Sky Sports News, not just the, the thing with your man, Jeff Stelling. But then I'd put the television off. I never saw it. <laughs> and I had to actually look it up. As you say, Jason, but it's just the. Uh, out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. Like, why? Uh, you see, before, no, no, you'd have been like, how, uh, amazing, how funny is that? You know, it's not even, who cares? Who, who gives a shit? I don't give a I shit, don't. I don't care, nobody cares anymore. Uh, Aye, uh, no interest at all. It's not like I've got anybody here that I can slag off anyway, I mean, there's no, 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 no monkeys south of the border. <laughs> <laughs> so are we all confident then for Wednesday night, do you think? No, I, I'm I, confident, I, but no, I'm confident. Celtic are five to two in the bookies to win. I'm excited, confident, if you know what I mean. Ah, because it's the first game of the Champions League, and it's like yeah. anything, anything can happen. It's like the first page of the Rovers. And I do, I do believe that Celtic will we will not see anything like the performance we've seen at the weekend. The, the, the team will be lifted by the occasion, by the fans, by the manager. And it's just, I just think it's shaping up to be one of these great nights. Something in me think tells me we're going to see Tony Watt starting. I don't know what it is. I have this sneaking suspicion now that he's going to start. If they play four four two, I think he'll start. But if it's one man up front, I don't think he will. He'd be a surprise package, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. That, this is one of them that obviously you've got the Green Brigade who they'll be singing anyway. You know that goes with it saying they'll they'll have the they'll have the atmosphere bouncing at their side, and the, a lot of the fans feed off them, which is fine. But in these nights. These are the nights that see if the team is performing in the park and it's attack, 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 and we're we've got the place but you're talking about songs getting started in the Celtic end and reverberating around the stadium and just that full ground absolutely bouncing it's just what a sight and it's just amazing to be in 
Yes, uh, have you got anything special planned for Wednesday, Jason? You finish work earlier? Are you meeting up with your kids going or are you just... No, no, I'm not taking the kids. No, I'm meeting the parrot. Uh, finish work at five. Big Nigerian guy I work with, Big Amos, he's coming. A uh, few of the boys who work. There's a woman, There's a woman. she's up working from... She's a Liverpool fan. Her two kids play with Everton, uh, youth team. But she's contracting up in Glasgow then, uh, and uh, she was she was asking me for a ticket. So I think she's gone as well. So she's a big Liverpool fan, so she'll enjoy it at the start. I reckon. Obviously, you'll never walk alone and stuff like that. And then maybe do something for the justice for the '96 things like that. You can maybe see a few banners. So obviously, uh, she she's been dying to go to Celtic Park, so I think she's getting a ticket as well. So I'll, I'll take a wee walk up, meet the parrot, and maybe Mister Larkin and co. Got a couple of beers before the game and then just head up. But no, I can't agree. Well, you've been joined. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, we've been joined by Graham from Beyond the Waves. Graham, are you there? Yeah. Hello, hello, boys. How you doing? Hi, too bad. Hi, too Graham. bad. All good. Hey, man. What did you want yep. to talk about, Graham? Uh, well, first thing, I only have a couple minutes. I'm in between meetings, but I, I wanted to first just commend you guys for the show on Friday. Uh, you know, with regard to Hillsborough, I, it was a, a situation that. You know, I didn't know a whole lot about, but it was really moving. It was a great uh, theme, and I know I'm going off the topic here a little bit, but I just wanted to, to say thank you for that. That, that was just excellent uh, production with that. And, um, you know, I, I, and talking to other Celtic supporters, I mean, it, it, I just heard nothing but, but, but positive things. So, so really great work there. Um, I had a quick point about the game on Wednesday. I hear you talking about you know, the, the potential there, um, the opportunity that we have, maybe, you know, different formations. I think that this is going to be a situation where we've seen it in the past. I think it's going to take shape once again, where Neil Lennon is going to, is going to play a couple of players in some interesting positions. I think the opportunity here, especially with Joe Ledley and Kyle being out, Scott Brown not being 100%, I think Charlie Mulgrew is going to come back into the midfield, especially with his form dipping as of late. I think a good outlet for him would be on that left-hand side, not necessarily so much as a, a left winger per se, but a, left, a left-sided a left midfielder that you know Joe Ledley has played in uh, from time to time in the past. I think it's a good outlet here because <laughs> he's going up against Maxi Pereira, uh, who is a, a just, in my opinion, one of the most dynamic right-backs in Europe. Uh, if we can exploit uh, sort of his bombing runs and, and keep him occupied there, maybe have somebody slide over and occupy that void of space, I think that opens up some, some interesting opportunities. And it gives a, a bit more fortitude to the cent- central midfield that I think is, is lacking when you know, we go out like this past Saturday in a, a standard 4-4-2. I think there was, there was a bit of, of steel that was missing in, in the center of the park. Yeah, Graham, and it's, not, it's a good point as well playing Charlie McGrew on the left-hand side, because um, I think it was uh, Colin, Jason, we were talking to the weekend, Bobby Lennox, and yep. he was saying uh, it would also probably help as a Geary, uh, when he's not been on great form, it would probably help him a great deal to have Charlie McGrew playing in front of him. Exactly. Yeah, and allow him to, to overlap. I think that, that I mean, as Gary has been, uh, let's be honest, he's been rank rotten, you know, since he's come back from, uh, from, from an injury. It was a horrific injury, but playing behind Samaras for him cannot be easy. It's, it's so unpredictable. I mean, the, the, the beauty in, in Samaras and the way he plays is it's unpredictable for opposing defenders to pick up, but it's also unpredictable for our players to pick up. And, and that can be, that can be a challenge for, for Izzy trying to time his runs going to the left-hand side. That's a great point as well. You know, having Mulgrew there, you know, a bit more predictable, and, and hopefully he gets injected into the game a bit more as well. I think, Graham, it's a great point, because we've spoke about Charlie's too valuable to drop for the team, because he brings so much in offensive quality, you know, he's delivery into the box, second to none, free kicks, and even attacking corners and stuff like that. He maybe isn't as, obviously, I don't think he is as good in a defensive capacity, but this could be a great opportunity for him uh, to play in the midfield, you're right, with the injuries, it sort of it fits in there nicely, and yeah, why not? He wouldn't have any qualms about Thomas Rodney coming in to take his place in the centre defence like I would anyway. No, yeah, I don't think so. He's a potential first team player and he's a centre yeah. defender. So you've got him and yeah. Kelvin Wilson. And to be fair, and Kelvin Wilson, he took a lot of stick in the close season. People think he was going to be off. But he's dug in there and he's done really well. And I've been pleased with what I've seen for the start of the season. I was never his biggest fan for last season. But no, credit where it's due. And I'm delighted to say he's kind of turning around. 
Yeah, no question. Yeah. I think it also opens up an opportunity to have, you know, we, we talk about having a spare man, especially in midfield, and that opens up opportunities. From what I've seen of Benfica, they don't do a great job of tracking back. So if you can, you know, sort of stifle their supply line, as it were, and, and stifle any sort of advancing runs that they have, you know, players like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bruno, you know, who, who, who sometimes gets stuck up the, up the park, can't make their way back. I think Scott, I mean, it's a foregone conclusion. Scott Brown will start. Uh, giving him the freedom to play that sort of uh, floating role, you know, and, and not really having uh, having to have him on the hook for for a good positional sense and, and and things like that. I think that that can that can make him a lot more effective. There's one player that I think that the, I can only think of one player that's that I think is a certain. I think that's Chris Commons. He's the only player that's actually been consistently good quality and good value at the start of this season. Or am I wrong? What do you mean, a certain, a certain to play? Yeah. Oh no, Scott Brown's a certain to play. Yeah, so. Scott Brown. Scott Brown is the first name on Neil Lennon's team sheet every week. Yeah, the, the guy, the guy's not even anywhere near five times, and he's getting made. He's, he's playing in games in Europe. That's how important Neil Lennon sees him in his team. And when you hear his teammates talking about him, he's a very important player for the, one of the first guys teammates. Whenever you hear them get interviewed, the first guy they mention is Scott Brown. So he's obviously a big, big thing in that clubhouse as well, like um, dressing room, I'm talking baseball terms here. But um, no, I think Scott Brown is, even at 75%, threat, he's the first name in the team sheet. I agree, Harper. Yeah, and I, I think that, that Chris Commons, you, know, you can't drop him based off of his latest form, you know, to, to your point, Joe. And I, what I like to see from, from Chris Commons, I mean, obviously he's fit. He's a bit slimmer, at least in my assessment, but yeah. he tends to have that that swagger. You know, when he's walking up the, the park, he, he, he sticks his chest out. You know, he has a bit of, of sort of like that that overwhelming confidence that, that sometimes is missing from this side. I mean, I think that when we struggle, we tend to lose that that killer instinct that is, is absolutely essential. I think, you know, he has that swagger. You know, you see him constantly just letting it fly from just outside the 18-yard yeah. box. I think we can do with a lot more of that. Graham, listen, that's one of his, his biggest qualities. Chris Commons is a goal threat constantly. He's always looking. There was one at near the end of the game at the weekend where I was actually tearing my hair out. Why did you? It was just the start of injury time when he blasted one over the bar and you're like, it was the wrong option at the time. But he's the one player other than your strikers, your out and out strikers, who's, who's obviously scoring goals. He is a goal threat, but he isn't afraid to just step inside and let one fly. And uh, you definitely need that. Yeah, I agree completely. Listen, guys, I'll let you go. I'm going to uh, hang up and, and listen back, but, you know, yeah, great just stuff. Graham, like yeah, your, your option. Graham. Graham. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we just announced that on Twitter. You can uh, see details at BTW Celtic Show. You can search on eBay. Um, we are auctioning a, a signed copy of Phil McGillivan's Downfall, uh, which is going to be rare. It's not going to be the only uh, signed copy of the book, but... Phil's not going to be signing many copies, so it's certainly going to be rare, and it's an opportunity to you know raise money for a very valid cause, the We Oscar Appeal. Um, so far, the bidding is, is has exceeded two hundred dollars US, uh, so that's that's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, after I hang up, I'll tweet a link. So you know, if you're listening in, you want to visit, uh, make a bid. You know, like I said, it's going to to a fantastic cause to get you know a piece of uh, of. of Fantastic memorabilia, you know, the, the number one uh, selling book in Scotland just now. So it's, uh, it's going really well. Yeah. And it was a great show you done as well, Graham. I listened back. I, couldn't, I didn't get a chance to call in, but I listened back to it. It was an excellent show you done for the wee Oscar appeal. It was brilliant. So well done. <laughs> Thanks. It was a bit of a train wreck. It's not, you know, what I'm. Oh, it's good. It was really good. <laughs> not really what I'm, I'm comfortable with, but, you know, I, I just figured, you know, if my heart's in the right place, then uh, can't be can't be all bad. But, uh, yeah, we'll be back. Uh, this weekend, hopefully, with uh, a couple of victories to talk about. Hopefully, yeah. Graham, Graham, tune in for the drive time show on Friday morning, would you? Oh, yeah, that's absolutely brilliant as well with the boys from Australia. Yeah, uh, should go on this, the, should go yeah, on this talking, week again, sir. So. Talking you to some it, of the guys. You're going in, in the same all of a Reed Bevy session after it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, man, that, that 14 hour session, that, that's kind of happening. <laughs> Sorry, Graham, I cut you off there. What were you saying, mate? No, no, no. I, I was just talking to some of the guys at our, our CSC who were listening in, and you know, it's it's it works out quite well for you know folks in the East Coast of the U.S. because that's you know, the time that we're getting up and and getting out to work. So you know, to to put on the app and to 
you know, hear about Celtic, I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. You know, we really are uh, continuously innovating and it's, um, and I'm just, you know, proud to be a part of it. You guys are, are doing a great job, so. Uh, continuously innovating, you mean it's not a tired format? No, I, I wouldn't say so. I think uh, it's not, not only is it not tired, I think, you know, we're just getting warmed up. So yeah. more, more to come and, uh, you know, just uh, really enjoying it. So. Keep it up, boys. Super. All right, Graham. You too, mate. All the best. Talk later, yeah, Graham. Brilliant. Cheers for calling in, mate. Cheers. Thank you, Matt. Take it yeah. easy. Right. Um, what do we move on to now, then? Uh, <coughs> oh, the Invisible Trialist. <laughs> That's a, a, a request for a good mate of mine, Johnny, to see if uh, us or any of our listeners know who the Invisible Trialist was today. That was playing at Lennox Town and, by all accounts, they scored a goal. We've had James McFadden. We've had Emil Heskey. Hey, also, we had Rudy Scatchel. Uh, Any I've others? Never, I've never heard anything about this. I think I, I think I heard members of Tupac. <laughs> that was a hologram. <laughs> <laughs> that was a hologram, man. James Stevens coming back. The, 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 the parrot must know. Vincent, come on. Uh, well, it was, on, it was on Twitter today, and there was people even asking about the trial list of that, and I see the not through my usual catch and carry sources. But somebody threw out about uh, some uh, Rudy Scatchel, which I don't know would be taken. I would. He's not a bad um, player, is he? He's better than McFadden. Player, but he's a better option than McFadden, I'd say. I, I, I listen. See the players that that we brought in. though, we brought in Miku. We brought in Lassad. Um, I, I see how we got him with them first. I know, like kind of. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't really know if we need Rudy Scatchel or James McFadden now that we've got these boys in. I think I think with Scatchel though, I mean, if we've got to keep Brown fit for the Champions League games, I think Scatchel's a, a cash and carry Scott Brown and the fact that he'll move the ball about and he'll score us a few goals. If he's You're a, a cash and carry Paul Larkin. You say cash and carry Paul Larkin. We'll get it. Uh, I think if he's a couple of grand a week, now the sheriff's after payroll, you know what I mean? Making a phone <laughs> <laughs> The sheriff is the best nickname any players ever had in the history. Uh, I'll tell you, I've got a man, Pope Paul's flying to Donegal to man his ranch on Wednesday, and he's missing the game. Aye, no, man, he lives in the, man, his next door neighbours, Daniel O'Donnell. There's a ranch in Donegal? Down low, man, he's got a ranch. Full of cowboys when the Pope's polls are there anyway, I don't know about the so, 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 just, just like Dallas where it rained, is it? Oh, it's like that. Is that one of the, the Wolf Tones singing about the chicken runs, Las Vegas and the hills of Donegal, is it? I don't know about Dallas, probably Dallas, no man, <laughs> about a vodka sheet, but that's another story. The Donegal cowboy, eh? Hey? What's the nickname then? For, for what? I don't know, you say it's a better nickname than the sheriff. <laughs> Here, here, here's, here's the thing about nicknames about Celtic players. I only found this out, ashamed to say, I only found this out maybe a few months ago because I work with a girl that was her dad who gave him the nickname. See Billy McNeil how his nickname is Caesar. Aye. You know how he get called that. Caesar Romero. Aye, well done, Joe. Did you know that, Harper? I've heard Caesar, Am- Caesar yeah. Romero was the Joker in Batman. No, it was Fulshin's 11. No, aye, but Caesar Romero played the Joker in the Adam West Batman TV show. Aye, but it was the Ocean's Eleven because he had a car. And right. that's why they called him ah. Caesar, because he had a car. I'm just trying to t- t- tell Harper who Caesar Rivera was. All right. Cause... Because I always thought it was like the, the Roman Emperor, just because he was the, the captain. Yes. I, 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 I thought it was because he coming out because like, coming out in the steps when he got the big cup with Caesar, you know what I mean? No, I, 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 remember, I remember reading about him, about sort of a Caesar Romero at the time. Not the time anyway, he was probably <laughs> called Caesar before the European Cup final, right enough, so... Uh, Aye, so it was because he had a, it was only player on the team that had a car, seemingly. Right, right. So you know how I'm called the hat on the message boards? Because you're bald? Uh-huh. What, what, Celtic, what Celtic player's nickname was the hat? Paul makes day. Why was this? Why was this? Why was this? Listen, I've asked lots of people and that noise, no, his nickname was the maestro. I, d- I never knew that. Why was his nickname the hat? Because his hair never changed for about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> it, the players said it was because he was full of tricks. A magician's heart. That's what this because I, I always remember this because when after the centenary year, right? Ah, it was because book, his hair though, his hair never changed for about a minute, year. This book came out after the centenary year, and uh, I can remember having it. I remember reading it at the time, and I had all the players and the wee sort of shoot annual sort of thing, favorite movie, favorite music, like that. 
nickname, club nickname was the hat, and his was the hat, and it definitely said because he was like, a, it was four, he was four tricks. It might have been, might have been. What a player that what, boy was. What was his other nickname again that was in the book? Uh, what was because he had this uh, split personality? The players used to call him some mad boy, and then when they got him out, and they got him, got him drunk, and he started going mad. And he pretended he was this Italian bloke. That's no. right. You told me that. What was, I was like, what was his name? I can't remember, it's in that book, Happy Birthday to Your Celtic. Ah, I was, remember you telling me. It. it was Benick was on here talking about it last time, remember? <laughs> it's like, you know, Paul was there, so quiet. You know what I mean? The scene the ones they got, they got a few drinks in them. They, 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 they'd say to him, right, go and be whatever this guy's name is, and then he'd just turn into this guy for the rest of the night. Big <laughs> <laughs> psycho, split, split personality, like, brilliant. Oh, fantastic. Uh, anybody, anything else someone wants to bring anything up? Because I'm running short on topics here tonight. <laughs> running short on topics. Uh, it's, it's when, the, when you think about the time that we had off, you thought you would have thought we'd have stockpiling stuff to talk about, but there's no one. Well, there's a there's a ton of things you can moan about for Saturday, but you at the end of the day, I don't really want to moan. I just want I to see, look forward to Wednesday night. Exactly. I don't want. I suppose the point of the show was kind of first Stephen back again. What, what, Joe, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I called him Yo-Yo for now. You alright, you alright? Yeah, I'll have to get Stephen back on a different lane. You know. I'll call him Yo-Yo for now. Just to blow my ears off there. Joe, what's your plans for Wednesday night? Are you going out or are you just watching uh, I have to go to Athlone on Wednesday, so I don't know what time I'll be back at. So, mm. I'll go to Athlone at 7 o'clock in the morning, and then I'll have to be back. Where is that? I think it's about two, two and a half hour drive, I'm not too sure. It's right. Am I driving? I'm saying each way. Is, ah, it's point. each way, yeah. So what's the what's your what's your favourite Champions League game? Uh, in last in memory at Celtic Park, what game you hope we could emulate? I, I would I, I would settle for the three 0 Benfica. Oh, I have first thing just, around. Listen, can I just hold that thought, right? I don't know if this is in reply to your question, but Big Stuart eighteen eighty eight has tweeted us saying Neo Baba trained with Celtic the Irish under 17 captain not back man new for Celtic plays with Castle Bar at the moment what's his name? Neo Neo Baba N-E-O first name second name Baba how do you spell <laughs> hey, 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 hey Stephen I think Stephen's been eaten by Daleks <laughs> <laughs> well didn't mention the Daleks man that's that's bigger than its highest form at the minute you know what? no way uh, you're not meant to mention Daleks, like that's that's a. Did you not know that's a reference to the Ibrox disaster? No? I did not know that. No. I neither did anybody else until the commitment to follow follow. I d- I seen I seen a mention of Daleks today on Celtic Man, but I didn't go into the thread. I assume that's what it was then. This is the this is the latest thing that Daleks is meaning because because Daleks can't go upstairs or something. They're absolutely deranged. I don't know where they get it from. This is the first time I've heard this about puff. But I mean, even if somebody did come up with something like that there as a slur, it's just it's shit. <laughs> aye, aye, exactly, aye, as if, aye, stupid. But listen, I Neil Baba, so I don't know if that's who the trialist was or if this is... How do you spell Baba? B-A-B-A, surprisingly enough. <laughs> Back to that. It sounds like a rapper. Neil Baba. Ali's son. I found, I found so, Baba Neil, it's a restaurant in California. <laughs> so, so, to be fair, right, it says here there's this, the Irish under-17 captain, and to be fair, I think you'll be finding a lot of Irish players with similar names... In the next <laughs> but here's your main news. Main, main you spoke about that years years ago. Harper. Remember, I said to you that I, I I thought like that Ireland would be the first team not in Africa to win the African Nations Club. <laughs> because honestly, and I, I honestly think Ireland in, in a couple of years' time, a lot of Polish kids. I see a lot of Polish kids in my wife's school. A lot of African kids. See the level of uh, like the size of people in Ireland in the, in the next ten to fifteen years. It's going to be unbelievable. Draw the youth team is absolutely. Draw the youth team. We've got a very, very good youth team, and uh, I would say probably only 25 percent is Irish. The parrot's just text Mary Skype's gubbed. Yeah, Joe. Jesus, we didn't notice that. I was just being. I was just being quiet. That's a nightmare. Eh? Oh, he's he was good for a few stories. Uh, his blog on Wednesdays, as I say, ends up with lap dancing and cheese and toast. So keep his it other, up. His other blog was really good. I bet he's scouts, scouts, mate. That was excellent. That was excellent. And um, they're not allowed to. They're not allowed to. The three rules: no father, Ted. <laughs> we'll, we'll scouts, I can't remember what the other one was, but that's, all right, no father, Ted. 
<laughs> so a bit of background about the obviously the podcast the other night. Uh, I con obviously after the Hillsborough, uh, but the verdict had come out and the report had been leaked and whatever. It was always a topic of conversation for football fans and especially Celtic fans because we played our part in the benefit game and stuff like that. And with the close affinity of the city of Liverpool, so I mean, we've been down there a lot. I felt it'd be good for us to cover it so I contacted a few of my mates and all my mates are all Everton fans I've got a couple of boys came to my wedding that were Liverpool supporters but they wouldn't be uh, diehards that would go to games and stuff like that so I contacted my good mate Ian he's going to Lisbon with us uh, to the Benfica game and says who could you get and it's quite funny how we got Eddie because uh, Ian's got a good few mates that are Reds but he's like Eddie will be good but he says I could have got some other nutcases or he says you'd never have shut them up they'd be ranting, raving, swearing, shouting and stuff you know and he says it would have been car crash material but he says Eddie would be the most sort of sensible at the lot of them and I think it come across that he was quite balanced in his viewpoint and he was very clued up. Yeah. I actually, all... I sent the link out to a lot of Liverpool fans and I met a few of them at a party on Saturday night and they said they loved it. You know? I know, was, and he made it, Joe, because see, before we actually recorded it, and we're not, well, me personally, I'm not very good at recording stuff, I'd rather do it live, what was it like at the end, when we get the take out, it took us five takes. <laughs> I was trying to do the intro, like the, the outro at the end, well, ladies and gentlemen, and Paul were just sitting there, and every time I go, I go, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the live homeboys, ah, oh, bollocks, and we'll be back and do it again, so Paul just was just sitting there waiting for me not to balls it up, so we, so we can all yeah, go. Well, you're drinking by any chance. I had one glass of wine during the show. I was, I was just, I was, I was, I, 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 Joe, I, I, listen, as we said before, you could get, you could get my head inside one of the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, and I think, see, before we came on air, like me and Joe and Paul were saying, right, what will we, before we called Eddie up, he says, right, how will we pitch this? What will we, because obviously we weren't wanting to hear us talking. It was just all about Eddie talking and maybe I was asking him a couple of questions. So we were trying to say, right, how can we lead into this? How can we lead into that? And obviously he, he's feeling very emotional about the full thing as well. And you didn't, you didn't want to put your foot in asking something that maybe is a bit off limits. Or, I don't know, you know. It's one of these ones you didn't really know how to approach it. But right at the start... Joe introduced us, introduced to Eddie, and he just went off in one. Didn't he? Oh, I for, for about ten, for minutes, ten minutes. I just said I did this big spiel, and then I brought Jason in. He said hello, Paul. Had said hello, and then Eddie said, "I said go ahead, Eddie, there, say hello." And about ten minutes later, we were all just, just sitting there listening to him still, as he just went on. But that that's that, that was brilliant for us because it meant the show just it just started there and then. You know what I mean? And do you know do you know what it came across good as it came across like he's on you, Eddie. He, he seemed very comfortable, which was obviously something that he's worked aiming to do you wanted him because as you say Jason he was obviously going to be emotional about it and you wanted him to be comfortable and it certainly came across as he was just sitting talking to three mates that he's known all his life and the fact is he doesn't know anybody he'd only spoke to you briefly on the phone Jason and, as, and that wasn't through the wonder of editing either because Joe says to me I hadn't had to edit anything no. and it was practically up straight away do you know what I mean so that was, that was absolutely brilliant man. No, and as I say, well, that's Scousers for you. They're the same as us, you know. They're the same as, like, fake Celtic fans and Everton, Liverpool fans, exactly the same, you know. Just the same kind of patter, the same kind of humour. And even in the depths of despair, when you're talking about a subject like that, that just goes beyond the pale, you can still find time to have a wee laugh at the end, you know, because yeah. it's... I think that's... We've only got our humour. I mean, I... I I don't even know if I've told it on this podcast before. But one of one of my great mates for Liverpool, uh, Barry Murray, and any any Everton supporter uh, will know Barry. Barry's he looks like Bluto at Popeye, <laughs> and he, he never misses an Everton game wherever they play in the world. Pre-season tour, my big mate Ian's the same. But pre they were all booked to go to Indonesia uh, for pre-season tour, and they called it off two nights before it. Some of the lads were in Dubai on their way to Indonesia. They were all going. So they were up uh, for the motherwell friendly. I got them into the local boozer here and uh, we had a great day out with them. But if I go, I'll go with all those guys. They run the independent Everton Supporters Club. And uh, a couple of other mates I know that never miss an Everton game, they always play a game of spot Barry. See the away games. First to see Barry because he's every every single game. And in the 70s, Everton played a pre-season friendly in Egypt. And I don't think Barry had been abroad before. And uh, he books up and gets a flight out of Cairo 
and uh, he stayed in the same team as the Everton Hotel. He had to done any research to find out what the weather was like in Cairo, and he turned up with a sheepskin coat on. <laughs> <laughs> and he walked in and Bob Latchford seen him and says, what are you doing here? He says, what the fuck do you think I'm doing here? <laughs> but oh, the guy, the guy's an absolute legend. And anyway, Barry's, you know, he'll not mind me saying this story, but Barry's father, his father was an Everton legend. You know, they were all, well, it's Irish, all it's Irish car. And, uh, uh, I, 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 I can hear I can myself repeating myself. Yeah. Oh, wait, yeah, that's because I took my headphones out to go and get a can of beer at the fridge because I didn't know why you missed the story, so wait, no, I'll just right. take it back in. Aye, so Bar- Barry, his family, all oh, the Irish Catholics in Liverpool, and uh, his, his, his father was a legend, going to watch Everton, everybody knew him. So his father died, uh, about three, I think it was about three years ago, and a uh, big massive funeral. I'm sure he got buried in like, all the Everton colours. And uh, it was at one of the local uh, churches near Goodison. And Barry's from Kirby, but I'm sure it was in near Goodison. I'm not exactly sure, but one of the local chapels anyway. And uh, the big massive do. Everybody was there, all the Everton lads for years ago. Everybody was there. Big massive funeral and everybody decked out in all the Everton colours. All the songs at the end of the night. So just as usual with a funeral, it's party time at the end. You know, the difference between a Catholic funeral and a wedding is there's one less person at a funeral. <laughs> and, uh, so everybody's had a, had a ball of a night and they're all leaving at the end of the night and Barry's like shaking their hand, they're all cuddling him and that. <laughs> but, but the lads turn around to Barry and says, I tell you what, Barry, can't wait till your mum dies because that was some night. <laughs> 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 Because <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 tell, he's telling everybody this, you know. I wouldn't be saying it, it wasn't coming to him. But that is, he's, uh, I, he's an absolute legend, brilliant. Oh God, that's funny. I know. It's like some of the stories I've got for, like, for I was like sixteen. I would, I met all these scousers in Ibiza in uh, nineteen eighty eight, and it was funny. I'd. I'd Bought an Everton shirt, no, was you'd, you'd watch it on the TV when sports night was on and stuff like that. It was the half and half ski hats. And uh, so if you were in the jungle, it was either half Celtic, half Man United, or half Celtic, half Everton. And then, so Everton, I picked Everton as my team. Brookside was on all the time and things like that. One summer in bread, and it was Liverpool, cool city, obviously, the problem with unemployment and stuff like that. But there was something about the Scousers. And uh, went to Ibiza, 16. I was walking down the street and I had an Everton top on and this guy walking towards me with a Celtic shirt on and I shouted over, all right, and he's like, he was a scout, he said he was an Evertonian, so he's still one of my best mates to this day and started going down to Liverpool, I'd get in once a month and he would come up once a month to see Celtic and uh, followed them all over England and we were, Celtic were, well, obviously went into the rotten mob doing their nine in a row. So I was going down there once a month and I was, from 16 to about 19, I was getting a half in the train and I uh, just came down and staying at Jeff's mum's back in Kirby. And then out in the nightclubs in Liverpool, cream and stuff like that. Happy days. It was brilliant. So I just got to know loads of them and I've been good in ever since. And it's brilliant. Just just the same as us. That, I didn't watch Everton. Celtic's my team, obviously. You know, that goes without saying. But I've always enjoyed going to watch Everton. And it's sort of different footballing experiences. And I've followed them all over England. And they've got a fantastic support. But really, really faithful support that stick with their team. And... In recent times, the very little. I mean, the last trophy they won was 1995 FA Cup. I was there at Wembley, but they they stick there. They stick with them, but it's, it must be demoralising supporting a team that's a massive, massive club. But you know, at the start of the season, you've got absolutely no chance of winning the league. Mm. You know, and it's just it's everything that's wrong about football. You know, because back back in the 80s and stuff like that, loads of different teams. I mean, your Aston Villa's won the league. You're not. Oh, no. And Everton, Everton won it a few times, Liverpool obviously. And there was loads of different teams and then it started probably started with Jack Walker, didn't it, in nineteen ninety five? Was it ninety five? Yeah, like, the money's was... ruined football in the world over like. I, I, I think it was Jack Walker, because when Jack Walker sort of bought the league for Blackburn Rovers, when they signed Alan Shearer, Man United couldn't afford them. Yeah. You know, and then it's just sort of escalated for there. And it's 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 now, I mean, Man City last year, 
obviously they've got a cracking support and a cracking fan base as well that have followed their team through every division. And you didn't gr- begrudge it, them winning the league last year, but their honeymoon period's over, and because they've bought the league, they just mean the same to me as like Chelsea now and stuff like that. You, you kind of feel for <clears throat> some of the fans, because Man City had some of the most loyal fans. Oh, in England, like, do you know what I mean? The, 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 even when they went down the, down the division to the first division, they were, they were selling it home games week in, week out, like, do you know what I mean? Same with um, me. Sorry, go ahead. So it's just, a, I know what you mean, Jason. It's like in the, you, you kind of start to go against these teams that are just flinging money at it and they're kind of, they are ruining the game. But sometimes you just think, well, it's, it's, it's not really nothing to do with the fans. Like, do you know what I mean? They kind of get a lot of it sometimes. Eh? Yeah, no, it's, it's nothing to do with the Man City supporters, not at all. Uh, but you see, obviously, me and you spoke about you see Man City straps pop them up and draw them yeah, that now. Yeah. Definitely. What did they say that? Eh? I remember oh when Man City were in the second division, I remember sort of following them for a wee bit because I thought some of their players were pretty decent, like Terry Cook and that. And I remember watching them going right. up the leagues, like, you know, but then after a while, just, I just sort of like, couldn't afford to follow two teams. I didn't really give a shit. Do you know what? It became fashionable as well. We support Man City because the Gallagher brothers. Was I made, did. Made I, I tell I you an interesting story. I went to one of their concerts. It was one at Loch Lomond. They played two, date, two dates. And uh, there's loads of kids there with Man City shirts on. I think it was Liam says, what have you got these shirts on for? Do you actually support Man City? They started giving them loads of abuse. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I never forget, see you, mentioned skirts was in Man City. I remember when I, I lived in New York, I must have been 22 at the time, and we were in the, one of the biggest Man United bars, I think in the, might have been the world, is in New York. It's called Nevada Smith's. It's just a Man United, like, Mecca. Oh, if you go to the city, the, the, the Rev was talking about that in one of the podcasts. Oh, the huge, Rev and Graham. It's a huge it's, big bar. Like it's it's, it's a, shut down now, seemingly. It's shut down. I, I don't know. Uh, that. There was something to do with one of the barmen and that they did a bit of a raw deal. I don't know. The guys were talking about it beyond the waves a few weeks ago. But we went there. I went there because a lot of my mates were my United supporters and they'd come over from, for, for a bit of a holiday. So we all went down and it was the, uh, I don't know whose testimony that was. It was a friendly. I remember when Paul Lambert almost boxed the head off David Beckham? Aye, we beat them. Aye, we beat them. They, they, they Lennon scored. That's right. And uh, I remember starting the bar, and there was a Scouse guy starting next to me. And we're just chatting. And I was telling him, I support Celtic. And he goes to me, do you support any of our teams? I said, well, I'll follow Man City. But he turns around and he goes to me, and he's wearing my United top. And he goes, you're a disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourself. I says, what, I says, what are you talking about? And he goes, you're a neo-Nazi, they're this, they're that. You should be ashamed of yourself. And I said, hold on a second, mate. You're a Scouser. And you're in a Man United bar and you're telling me I'm, I should be ashamed of myself? It's ridiculous. It was very, very, very bizarre. Aye, there's, there's a, I think there's actually a Man United supporters club in Liverpool. It's probably, you're lucky, there's probably half a dozen in it. But now nah, there's no love lost between them. And I've seen that it's quite ironic, you know, and it's probably maybe not the time and place, obviously, with the Hillsborough stuff. But it's, they're, they're obviously getting bad press for what their fans were singing at the weekend and stuff like that. But, I suppose you can think back for, I mean, Everton fans were guilty as well, but Liverpool fans obviously, they sung about Munich for yeah, years yeah. and years and years. And I thought, one thing I thought about the Man United fans, which was, I thought it was pretty apt, it was after the Hillsborough uh, game they went to Anfield, and I think the press yeah. and all that were like, but obviously it wasn't the same rabid press as it is nowadays with all the internet, uh, things like that. It was, there was a lot less news about these things back then, no mobile phones, stuff like that. But I think the Man United fans, when they went to Anfield, they sung Where's Your Famous Munich Song. And I thought that was all right, you know, because it was just to say to them, well, because Liverpool never ever sung it for that day. But I think hopefully Man United fans could maybe just, they can take the lead and say, right, no more. Because I think we're all grown up now and we're all trying to be, it's not the same world we live in nowadays where you did be horrible to other cities and things like that, you know. Hopefully... Because there has been a definite swing in Merseyside that for the 25 years I've been going down at the start, the fans stood together. But in the last 10, 15 years, it started to get a bit nasty and you get got a, a bit of trouble at derbies. <clears throat> but I think just in the last year or so, and especially now since Everton's great tribute the other night, I think you'll see more of the fans in Merseyside standing together again at the games. And that's one thing... Wait, wait, Ellie's going to bed. Night, night, darling. <laughs> and uh, that's one of the things that stands them apart between normal city rivalries. Yeah. They they hate each other in a football sense, but they're best mates away from the game. And they are a united city. 
you know, without a doubt, they do stand shoulder to shoulder. And they they both come from a very working class background. And I know I, I go on one of the Celtic websites, I wind up with the, the copites and stuff like that. But nah, they're, I, I have no time for them as a football team. But their fans and that, they're, it's, sometimes it's like two sides of the coin. The Scousers, anyway, I'm not talking about the Scandinavians that follow them, see, no, the see, Irish. See here, see here, the I, I didn't mind Liverpool. I didn't bother about any English teams to bother. She's just something that doesn't, I didn't care about. But when I moved to Ireland, the only supporters here who really just pissed me off, like, the majority of them, when I worked in my work in that, and Joel Tay was a big Liverpool supporter in there. And if Celtic would get beat for Rangers, they'd be slagging me to death. Like, they were Rangers oh, I know, fans. I know. Right? And even in the pub here in Drogheda and Sarsfields, right? Um, you would you would, would be in to slag you like but the Man United fans on the other hand they would be in wanting to see Celtic beat Rangers now whereas Liverpool fans the pub would want Rangers to score against you sort of thing so that's just the wee thing that obviously it's just your own wee personal things that pissed me off eh? so really put me off against Liverpool because it's just the way they are here plus I thought everybody here would be Celtic fans when I first moved that was a big shock and all. Uh, you, th- you, just, thought, you thought you were coming to the Emerald City, didn't you? I actually thought every, every single, I mean, I know I've spoken about it many times, but the very first article I wrote for Lost Boys was, was entitled Why Are There No Celtic Fans in Ireland? And that's basically how it felt. I couldn't even find a pub. And I turned with about 50 pubs. And a Celtic game on at the weekend when it was on live on the television. So... Uh, no, it was that was a it was a certain eye opener when I came here. Just while you're still on, and I see Steve has joined us again, so we'll come to him in a minute. But just while you're back on about Hillsborough there, I don't know if you've read um, <clears throat> Peter Hoon's blog this morning. Um, if you follow the farm on Twitter at the farm 2012, and then the blog is the farm music dot wordpress dot com, and uh, Peter had a fantastic blog, but he was he was there. Um, when the when they get when the panel and then the the, the boys came back with the verdict at the, was it a big it was a big abbey or something was it Jason a big church or something like that the last Tuesday was it it was Liverpool Cathedral ah the cathedral ah and the blog's called the, the blog is entitled many many Hawaii's but do not see and it's an absolutely phenomenal read he he was there obviously on the day and that like and he, obviously he's a big part of the Justice Tonight band with Mike Jones and, and Pete Wiley and the rest of the farm. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever had the, the chance to see them, but when I was at the Stone Roses gig there a couple of months ago, and I hadn't even looked, I didn't even know who the support acts were going to be or anything like that, and uh, Justice Tonight Band came out, and uh, they were worth it, the entrance money alone, rather than the Stone Roses. Absolutely phenomenal to see Mike Jones and Peter Hutton and that, and so, listen, if you're on Twitter, go to the farm, 2012, and you'll see the link for the blog. But the, the, the web address, anyway, is thefarmmusic.wordpress.com, and it's an absolute, uh, it's quite an emotional read as well, because like, it's a, quite a long read. But it's, it's he, he was there. Yeah, that's like, it. He uh, talks about being there on the day and everything. Like. He's a big red, but the, the, the wee guitarist and that there, what blues, <laughs> I think most of the band were blues. They wrote the song Forever, uh, 1995 FA Cup final all together now. Change the words it. You know, for uh, relating to Everton, obviously. Just, but... just Jason, talking about that, just before, because I'll forget, like, I, I was doing an Ian Rush testimonial. I don't know if you were in that game, Celtic Liverpool. Uh, was that a 6 0? It would be 6 6 0, eh? Aye. Right. No, I wasn't there. The farm were to play at half time, and they came out and they set up in the penalty area in front of the Celtic fans. Off were gone badly, because they thought it was getting set up. They came and set up, and they basically played to the Celtic fans at half time it was absolutely phenomenal so that's what as you say because they were all blues <laughs> Aye, I see I seen them at the plaza the plaza ballroom it's gone but not forgotten in the tin uh, it was a great night I, I, I had an Everton away shirt on and I ended up getting on the stage with them <laughs> mad way years ago but uh, I, no it was good keep an eye out for that Justice Tonight band because I mean they are touring and they, and they play like universities and all stuff like that and absolutely brilliant man I mean Mick Jones to go and see Mike Jones playing live yeah. Superbly. And Billy Bragg, he's wrote a song, Don't Buy the Sun, is it? Uh, I've, heard, I've heard about that, eh? No. Well, so, Steve, uh, back. Aye, uh, listen, I've, I mean, I mean as, as long as nobody um, calls in, I should have a strong enough connection with my 3G. I'm on my phone now. That's, That's way better. Go for it, mate. You take over. I'm going to get a beer. 
No, it's just a change. They, they dressed this with the '96. Did you? Um, have you seen it on YouTube when Cantona appeared with them? Yeah, that was uh, that was when I, when I was at Stone Roses here in Dublin. Yeah, the special guest we had here was Shane McGowan, and I don't oh, know really? if he I don't know if he was piped a plank or something because how he was standing up, I'll never know. I've never no. seen him so hell in my life. But Cantona was the special guest in Manchester that they had the, the week before, right? No, but you were talking about my blog there, about my old man's golden rules. We weren't allowed Father Ted. Um, we weren't allowed to play cards in the house. And we weren't allowed scousers. And the other one was we weren't allowed to walk by a nun in the street. We always had to put a pound in the box. But um, as I say, you know, the, the, the lad who I was writing about, Michael, I said earlier on the show, he was actually at the, the Hillsborough game. Right. And he'd actually been on, he he got a ticket for the other end and he'd seen the kerbuffle, he was unaware of the tragedy that had happened and then obviously we're old enough to remember the good old days of going to the football without mobile phones and stuff and he ended up going on a bender after the game and his mum and dad were sitting late at night on a Saturday night unaware if he was okay or not, you know. And he sort of got home in the Sunday morning a bit rough and weary and his mum nearly throttled him. So, I mean, I was, I've got some friends, actually, it's quite ironic, Jason mentioned Kirby. I've got some good mates from down there myself and they sh- a couple of them pointed out people in the street that, that had lost people. So, yeah, but, I mean, it's it was a tragic enough event with actually, without actually knowing people who had lost folk. You know, it's quite sad. You know Definitely. My, my um, sort, of, sort of overriding memory at that time was 1989, I would have been 15, just turned 15, and I was already probably, I think I was about a year, two years on the supporters bus every week, and I used to live. Yep, I'm still here, yeah. yeah. Just to sound a bit more quiet. And uh, my, 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 my biggest memory, I suppose, at the time was um, the game, the, the, the following week, it was just two weeks after it, so the game was still days part. or something after it, I can't remember, there was a couple of weeks after it. The thing I can, and even then it's still, because I can remember I would, I would have been pissed then at 15, even like when I think about it. But anyway, or stoned or something. But I can remember, I always remember if, uh, when we went every week, the bus that went on, and we always parked in Nuneaton Street. Remember Nuneaton Street? I think it's yep. been a bit right? And uh, that's where we were bus park. And for some reason, for this game, the bus was parting away at the other side, like where uh, the Celtic end, but the other side, what would you call it over there? I can't remember it, but it was a completely new place for me and my three pals who went to the game every week, right? But nobody bothered, seemed to be bothering about us back in the day, the two kids, they were right. And I can remember walking to that game absolutely terrified that the three of us, the four of us would be left in Glasgow because I didn't have a clue where I was gone. I was just aiming for Celtic Park sort of thing. Like that was one thing that really sticks in my mind, that uh, the buses in the park in Lanita Street. Another thing that really sticks in my mind was everybody flinging the money on the track. Aye, aye. And I remember the ball boys kind of didn't know what to do at the aye. start and eventually got somebody with buckets to go and collect it. And I remember that, that kind of sticks out. I didn't really remember much. I was in the jungle, but I can't really remember much about the game or anything like that. As I say, I do remember there being loads of Liverpool fans, or certainly maybe just Celtic fans with Liverpool tops on, Liverpool scarves all over the jungle like it was really it was, I can remember the sense of the occasion but the, the details are kind of missed as I say but yeah. now that's the thing that really sticks, just kind of still stands out for me and that picture um, uh, the, the one that hangs up in Celtic Park I seen it when I had a tour there years ago the, the, the two wee boys uh, the boy in the, the Liverpool tracksuit and the boy in the, the wee boy in the Celtic strip standing with their, their heads bowed um, it's a really kind of haunting, haunting picture I think everybody knows the one I'm talking about Painting. Yeah. Aye. Aye. But I mean, for me, I mean, I remember, I, mean, I was joking me um, Harper about it the other night about my old man with the Scousers. I remember after the game, we were talking about a, a period in, I suppose, United Kingdom society when there was no such thing as a cheap hotel. You know, you only had the Hilton and that. There was no travel lodges and that. And a lot of the Scousers had come up and they'd nowhere to sleep. You know, and about 35 of the lads ended up in the Casamilk uh, Labour Club. And my parents were up having a drink that day. And the the band stopped at half time. Some cash and carry country and western band <laughs> we usually had up there, and um, they actually stood on stage and they went, "Listen, we've got thirty five guys here. They've nowhere to go for the night. Is there any get a couch for them?" And you know, and like the comp pair was sort of nervously waiting for one hand to go up, and they actually had to draw names out of a hat to take these guys home. 
<laughs> because if that many folk wanted to put them up, you know, and I think there might be a, still a few of them cutting about cast them up, you know, they get a fry up the next day and a, a case of heavy and they were sent on their way. But it was a very good um, community thing, you know, that that's what really struck me about Saturday, as I said earlier in the show. I mean, middle class Tory voters in Perth had, had no, I had more, I've got more in common with a scouser than I have with somebody that votes Tory and drives a tractor a mile and a half from where I live, you know. Well, that's it. And see, Back, getting back to the days as well, like I'm talking 1988 when I started, obviously, getting down to Liverpool on a regular basis. We were 16, and uh, my mates from Liverpool were like 17. So at 17, a couple of them were maybe 18. I always remember uh, the first time they ever came up was an old firm game. Uh, I, I can't, we won it anyway, we beat them. Uh, I think it was at a the time they hadn't beat us for nine years. I think that was still in that time. They beat, mind Alec Miller scored, and then it was nine years the parkhead before the beat is again. I think it was maybe during that time, I'm not sure. But uh, I'm sure we won anyway. And six of them came up. And you're right, there was the, nobody was booking any hotels in the days, mate. It was you had to get somewhere to kip. So my mum and dad were willing to put three of them up, a couple of my mates put one up, and somebody else one up. And of course, mate, we were sixteen, so you were you were maybe having a your parents would like you hear the odd shandy at the weekend, obviously eating the carrots and stuff like that. But uh, your official drinking capacity was almost <laughs> <laughs> your official drinking capacity was uh, it was severely curtailed. What for want of a bit of face? But I could always mind my dad, God rest them, we're going down to pick the guys up at uh, Motherwell Station. They were going off at Motherwell and we're going in the supporters bus to the game and they fell off the train with bottles of white wine and all that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's my mate's there. Oh, all right, lads. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, happy days. Yeah, they are the, be- the best days ever. And then when we went down there, we would we would go down on mass to Liverpool, and it was absolutely brilliant. We just always stayed at my mates' bit, and uh, we'd guest passes to get to Cream Quarter Quadrant Park. Cream was Nation. it Kirby? Was it Kirby you stayed in? Aye, Kirby. Did you, ever, did you ever go in the Mani Tavern? Did you ever drink the Mani? The Mani, my mates, they would drink there, but they would always drink the Fantail or the Todd, the Johnny Todd. I was at, I was in Kirby Town before it got knocked down. See the it was one of the biggest football parks in uh, England and the Kirby Town Football Club. That was the old nightclub we used to go there as well. But I, I was I was doing there every 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 month at least, mate. Jason, can I ask you how did you at sixteen get into that? I mean, how, who, I who did in, you? I, I met them in Ibiza. Well, you were my own Do you know what I was going to say? Did you maybe meet them at a rave? Because that was kind of in the, the race to start. Aye, well, it was not well, Ibiza. Uh, <laughs> <else>, 1988. <laughs> right, I, I, kind of, I, I never said that at the start, sorry, no. Aye, so I started doing that and then started doing So obviously, I would I would start following Everton, whatever, uh, any games, been to Chelsea like four times and stuff like that, on the trains. And uh, I loved all the old Scouse fashion side. So always, every time you go down there, you would see what they were all wearing and you would wear the same with the... I was wearing like the track suits and stuff like that, four loads of folk up here and things. You must have a scorecard for Wade Smith, did you know? Aye, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> My mates acquired <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> so there was there was a few guys acquired and stuff down there, so you would just maybe give them a couple of quid and you could do the, the Lewis jeans and the cords and stuff like that, but yeah, aye. No, it was great days and I loved it and I just I just loved the city, I loved everything about it and they were the exact same as us. When you've got to watch Celtic away from home in Europe and stuff like that, these guys were just exactly the same, you know, they're same humour, same patter, just aye, the same upbringing as us. Ah, there's one each Newcastle, the first bloody attack. But uh, the same, just the same as ever. But it was for a wee guy at 16 and then there was a few of us went down for Wisher, there was quite a load of us. And uh, I we just we've just kept it going. Then I've started. I take like a Boston every year, maybe one or two games. We get in, take like a fifty-two seater, and uh, take all the boys down to the games. And that. so I've got loads. Well, you're thinking a shout me. I'll come do me one team because I see I'm, I've got a quite a, a quite a lot of blue kipper boys on my Facebook and that. You know. All right. Yeah. I know what he's. Sounds like good fun. Uh, we should all go. What? What was the nightclub underneath the Adelphi? Did you ever go in there? Aye, aye, off. Because I, I was you, in there. You've you, you, you been, you been a sailor. You, you would be welcome in that place. <laughs> I, I, I was in there when I was like a trainee and I, did, and I was in with 14 guys for Kirby and I didn't know Kirby had like such a bad reputation. So these girls were coming up with my, had my cut and haircut and my cords and that, as you do. My factory records t-shirt and these girls all, where are you from? I went, oh, I'm staying in Kirby. Oh, I couldn't see us. Yeah. <laughs> Kirby, there we go, you know, bye, good times. 
Uh, you know, happy days. Uh, I've had some great times down there, and as I say, they're all still my best mates, and uh, they're all. I mean, they're still they're still all up to see Celtic on a regular basis. They all still come up, and it's uh, it's brilliant. And just you uh, some of them gone. I know that they don't even know I do this. What do you tell them? They're all at the game tonight. So uh, there you go. But some of my mates live in London. The scousers there. So the Everton's got a big massive support in London as well. It's like uh, obviously the Ross scousers are doing their work wise. It's called Escla Everton Supporters Club London area, and they'll travel up to most home games. They'll run buses, trains. They get reduced rail travel and stuff like that. But yeah, there's uh, ah, they've got a great support. And for a for a team that's I mean, they were a massive team in England. They were a massive team, but it just they've not got the finances to compete at the <laughs> highest. On the, I think when you had, I think when Baxter went to Sunderland, they were the richest club in England, and then Everton took the mantle over from them, and then I think that's what certain Liverpool fans like to say, oh, we were an underdog, and then we overtook Everton for what it was. But I mean, I mean, it's a club, it is a. I mean, any team, I mean, I, I worked down there for six weeks a few years ago and, you know, they were phoning me up while you're in town and they made a point, they were trying to split you in half to either get you to Anfield or Goodison to prove what game you were actually at, you know. <laughs> but they, they they got me to um, they got me to Anfield for a when Liverpool played FC Kunas and it was I was in the main stand it was only six quid in nice night and um, all these Welsh people were sitting around saying look at how ugly those folk are and being like a proud Lithuanian descendant like yourself Mister Higgins in the great <laughs> season you know, I saw it, I went listen to this your Welsh so and so in the night portrayed so I ended up back in the boozer earlier on so a bit, a, what predictions are you going for Wednesday night? <clears throat> mm. uh, I'll go for a three-one Celtic. Mm. Harper, uh, come back to me. I'll go two-nil no Celtic. I go two-one. I'll go one-nil no if we play one man up front. I'll go two-nil no if we play if Tony Watt starts to get out. Do you think we have defence? We're going to keep a clean sheet. Yes, because I think. I think, as we said, I actually think that is probably a better shout than Paddy McCourt starting in the midfield. Uh, either, either Charlie McGrew or Victor Wanyama kind of showing up in the midfield and giving the defensive protection. And I think, yeah, if, if we play one man up front, we'll win one now, I think. I mean, can I, can I, play, um, can I play the Paul Larkin? I'll, 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 I'll ask one of his questions. Do you, how do you think that the media is going to try and keep... Um, Sevco in the conversation because obviously this is probably the most important week in Scottish football so far. Stephen, Stephen, to be honest, you, speaking from my own point of view, I honestly couldn't care less. Um, I don't buy the. In fact, this, this, you'd be hard pushed to find a daily record anywhere in Toronto. I used to get it in all the shops, right? And you didn't even. I can't, I've never even seen one here for long enough, right? Um, I don't watch the Scottish news very rarely anymore. I don't go on any like the Scottish newspapers, websites or STV, sport or anything like that. So they can say and do whatever they want. It makes absolutely not one slightest bit of difference to this kid sitting here. No, the only, the only reason I bring it up is that Paul had um, Paul had some interaction with Richard Gordon at the BBC, on, and who's an Aberdeen fan, and he's one of, to me, he's one of the few journalists who's actually, him, Jim Spence and that, actually, and the, the STV boys, aren't they, have they been too bad in it all? Aye, they're impartial to be fair. I think yeah. most of the guys are. Yeah. You know, the, the BBC's um, spin on Friday night was first the, the Craig Levine shambles with Fletcher, etc. And then they were talking to old Fat Sally about his plans and what, what did they reckon that the, the old co or Sevco, whatever you want to call them, plans were to be in the Premier League for next year sort of thing. And then they were talking about Lennon. You know, I mean, my earlier point, this, this is a week to me for Scottish football to smell the coffee. The zombies are dead. But, but Stephen... Stephen, listen, there's a thing, right, and I've seen a few people on Twitter uh, having a go at some of the STV boys and that because they're coming out with the Rangers stories, if you like, right, blah, blah, and it's like, people don't care, they're dead now. Listen, you've still got to remember that the Rangers fans are still a big, massive part of their readership and who their customers are probably their main customers. So at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, they're still going to be big news in Scotland because the supporters, the supporters didn't die. Yeah, but the I mean, reason... They're still getting big support. So obviously oh, I mean, they're I, newsworthy. 
I don't even news if you read the paper. I agree with you, but I mean, the only interaction I would say is I don't buy the record, I don't buy the sun, I don't listen to Neil Clyde now, but I mean, the one thing I will say is, is that I pay a TV licence and uh, as a BBC person, I've been a, a flat owner, so I mean, for, for me, for me, paying for a subject and having guys like Trainer still getting to basically. He's he, viewing. He, he, he's, he's a buffoon, that guy. He's an absolute the same as forever, isn't it? Aye, but you know, I mean, as I say, and I, I totally respect your point, David, because obviously they've they've got to keep they've got to keep going to the wider audience, and obviously they're going to. I mean, I think the chief sports writer from uh, McGowan from the Mail was down covering their game on Saturday, you know, and he's missed out another thirty Scottish games that should have had been more important. But as I say, to me, it's it's going to be very interesting to me is how they're going to spin to keep the two clubs linked, is it, uh, which they obviously aren't now because one of them's dead. But look at look look at Trainer's article today in the Daily Record. I mean, obviously the only thing he knows how to write about is Rangers. I mean, Joe, listen, I don't even know what I don't even know what that article is you're referring to. I wasn't really online today, so somebody I'm put on really, a, somebody put on Celtic Mind and they read it and was up there. And I, and I've not really been on the message boards either today. I've not been on. I had to go for another medical and all that sorts, but um, just. That's what that guy, that's that guy's bread and butter. He's not going to change now. You know what I mean? He's not going to. In fact, he's even got to be. People with him are going to be even more bitter because they want to just keep. Uh, you'll not change who I am, sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? He just doesn't want to be proved wrong. Guys are dinosaurs. They're not even worth. They're not even worth bothering about anymore. Like as you say, Stephen, I, I could even listen to any of the shows that these guys are on. They're given a platform because we, you know what you're going to get. You're not going to get a balanced opinion. You're not going to get an, an honest uh, review of things and look at things for guys that train on that. Just completely. The best thing to do with them is just ignore them. But you just know, slap them. The only thing, the only thing they're good at now is presenting radio shows. They're not good. They're not, they haven't got good opinions. They don't raise good debates. You know what I mean? See, Joe, do you know what? Do you know what? Why they're still there? Because Celtic fans hate them so much. Because the, because the first thing you read when they're on. And even just done it there the now. Did you read Trainer's article today? They're, they're actually there as bait now. Do you know what I mean? It keeps people listening because you love to hate them. And there is people who tune in to Radio Clyde because they love to hate them. They, 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 they're nothing but go on about it, but they still listen to it every night. And there is that sort of, they love, you love to be wound up with somebody, I can't believe what they're saying, so like, ah! but you still, it's like a drug, right? And they are there as bait. They're there, they're there to wind you up, they're there to, to get you to bite. But sometimes it, I just read it to make myself feel smarter. Because that wouldn't be hard. That's what I'm saying. That makes me feel Even good for myself. You. Hey! <laughs> see, see, for us, but we look at it from the Celtics' perspective. And yeah. do you think the the other mob, the Sefco mob, they, they think they hate them as well? <laughs> they've, they've, got the, they've got the exact same opinions as only about looking for their side. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think we're both right. They, they, they just they just do something to try and hack the other side off. But it's, really it's the, and they, they, they will not say that Rangers are a new club. <laughs> you know, they refuse to. I mean, I don't, I, maybe, they're, maybe they're saying it now, but I don't listen to it anymore. But any time I did sort of tune in, if I was in the car or that, they would never, if somebody would call in me a point about it being a new club, they would say, oh, that's a matter of opinion and stuff like that. Well, no, it isn't really. They are a new club. That's a fact. It's no matter of opinion, it's a hundred percent bona fide a fact. The old one died. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, see, they, see, sorry to interrupt you, Jason. I mean, obviously, I'll, 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 I'll link you with this. I mean, obviously, I listened to the podcast the, the Calouk boys done, and they were talking to the, the Jane Lewis. That was really good. I listened, I listened to the that one. Yeah, really good. Yep. Ian Monk one, yeah. And listen, it was great. And, and you heard guys like Tom English and they were really, really really relaxed. And then I heard Jane Lewis on Friday night. And she's obviously been giving stuff from higher up guys and Chick Young at the BBC saying, this is a party line and this is what you're going to know could be. And you yep. know, and us as, and us as licensed free peers, okay, yeah, I mean, Hopefully nobody's buying the record, nobody's buying the sun that's listening to this podcast, but certainly stuff like that. I mean, it's illegal How for you. Know. <laughs> 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 but you know what I mean? So, I mean, it's got to go further up the food chain than the actual presenter because they're all freelance people. So she's obviously going in at three o'clock on this Friday getting a mail of birds and saying, right, this is what you're... She, I mean, she must get embarrassed. I know she's married with two veins, so she's got to keep doing it sort of thing, you know what I mean? Keep the rules for the door, but... It's um, hopefully. I mean, I, I was still surprised at how many boys on the supporters bus going up on Saturday. They're not clever enough, boys. And I went, "What did you write about the Hillsborough stuff?" And I went, 
overstoat by in the sun now, Stevie, and I went, look, you actually read that comic? You know, and oh, they're, all no. sitting, they're all sitting with smartphones, and I'm brainwashed them all about Hail Hail Media. They might like it, they might not like it. I said, well, listen, you know, it doesn't cost it, and this guy's not on the good Celtic stuff. I said, just can phone in. They're all on Twitter. And I said, right, and hopefully with Paul's next book launch, I'm, they're all going to go along, you know what I mean? I just mean that this, I mean that the, the standard of stuff that's getting knocked out... Yes, the, do one ever. The standard <laughs> of stuff that's getting knocked out for uh, Graham's show for Beyond the Waves. Oh, that stuff, that, that, as I say again, that Hillsborough one you knocked out, I mean, that was very professional and polished, you know I mean? I know the BBC and the mainstream media ones probably took months, but yours was just a raw, off-the-cuff show, and it was excellent. That was audio gold. See what, what's good about this, right? And what's good about what's good about the thing on Friday night was those are the people I want to hear from. People on the street, people like you know Eddie who who runs a business across from the cop. I mean, those are, those are the guys you want to talk to because those are the guys in contact with the real source of passion, which is the football and the people. I don't want to hear from anybody else. You know what I mean, because. Aye, I would, I would totally agree. See, see the two, to be honest with you, that I've, I can actually listen to. See Stuart Cosgrove and Tam Cowan, I'm not going to cup of tea. I think they've been pretty honest with it. I can't stand that Tam Cowan. Uh, I'll Just be honest general. with you. I think, I think the two of them have been pretty good. And, I've uh, never been good about that. I'm not about that. No, I'll say it, but I just, I've always hated the guy. And when I used to read that paper back in Scotland and his column and that, I just didn't find them funny. I just think, he just... Ah, he's, he's, not, he's not a comedian, he's a... It's just a prick. <laughs> I think he's alright. He's, he's, he's the. I know he, he's, he's the Frankie Boyle of football journalism, is he? Is he? See, I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be honest. I've, I've had a couple of pints with the guy. He's back on. I just, <laughs> he's, just, I, he's just a right normal guy. He's all right. I wouldn't say I'm mates with him or anything like that, but I've had a couple of drinks with him and he's just a just motherwell daft, right? Motherwell supporter. He's not any any other football team. Just motherwell daft and. Uh, Bit of Celtic fans will think, oh, he, he hates us. But he obviously does, but he hates Rangers as well, or the old Rangers. He's just a normal, sorry, motherful supporter. And the guy's done all right for his cell. He'll, he'll not say everyone that everybody agrees with him. Maybe he says some stuff that's controversial, but I can the general thing, yeah, he's all right. I mean, the game on Wednesday night, who do you think Sky's going to have in the commentary box? I mean, hopefully they're not going to have Gordon Smith in, because he's on everything else these days, isn't he? The old... The main man himself. You would think they would to Charlie and Nicholas. I um, know, but I would. Gordon Strachan's more an ESPN man, isn't he? Yeah. I think Gordon. Well, ESPN and I think ESPN and Sky are in the and I think Cahoots. You could you could see Strachan maybe in there. I don't know. Strachan was Strachan was part of the. Soonest watch with Sky, didn't he? But Strachan was part of the ITV team, Aye. so it's not like he's exclusive to ESPN. Yeah. He done ITV for the. I don't know. I, I think Charlie Nicholas is a he's a stick on to be there. To be honest. And I heard Chris, I was listening to the last Lost Boys podcast there, Chris, Chris was talking about this, and he was getting a bit of, a bit of stick for Jerry, because um, a lot of Celtic fans just have no time for Charlie Nicholas. And uh, to me, Charlie Nicholas was still a big, big hero of mine. And uh, I, I don't mind Charlie Nicholas. When he, I, I, don't, I don't read the papers, so I don't read his column anyway. I think that's probably what he gets a lot of stick for, whatever. I don't even know what paper it is he writes for. But... Um, I have not really got too many problems with it, the things Charlie Nicholas says. Celtic, Celtic fans, we seem to have a thing where we we say something, right? And we have this opinion. And then if somebody comes out and says it in the press to say us what we think, we don't like it getting spoke about outside <laughs> in the mainstream. Like, right? That's Charlie Nicholas suffers from that wee bit. Because there's no doubt in my mind Charlie Nicholas loves Celtic. I think, I think the thing for me, Harper, is uh, we, we slag the... We slag ex Rangers players or Sevco, whatever you want to call. We slag them for totally unequivocally backing them, you no know, being totally biased, right, on the media. And then if we get a Celtic ex Celtic player that's a bit unbiased, we slag them. <laughs> you know, and it's like you're like, oh, wait a minute, what, what do you want here? Do you want a? Uh, because we always say that with like guys like David Prove and that they're always like their bread's buttered. But I just think. The guys, they don't play for us anymore. They obviously still love the club. I think Murdo McLeod, I think Murdo McLeod's excellent. I mean, he didn't grow up a Celtic supporter. I always think he speaks really highly of Celtic. Uh, I had a glass of orange juice in his first one. Oh, like, Jesus, here we go. Have, have you heard this? Have you heard this story, Jason? No. Nah. Harper's, uh, Harper's uh, Murdo McLeod's illegitimate son. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sorry. I, just I just dye my hair ginger. <laughs> I mean, can, I, can I just ask one more controversial point? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's reference a weekend before the game. I mean, I, and it breaks my heart as a working class guy who's quite in these trade unions to see it. But I think I quite think uh, Neil Lennon was correct in finding Thomas Rogner for opening his mouth to the media. References contract talks. See, uh, Thomas says that it was. Uh, it's quoted or it was taken out of context and he kind of denies it. How much did he get fined? A week's wages, I believe. Right, see, I, said, I, I, don't, I don't read any of this stuff. I don't. I tend not to believe anything. I'm like a total doubt in Thomas, but so th- tell me what happened. Did he, he was say, in the media or whatever? He was back home. The, the story, I believe, is he was back home in Scandinavia and he was um, talking to a few people over there. And obviously, we're the only fish in town now, so I don't know if Keith Jackson had got a submarine up to Bergen or something and was listening to the interview and talk was, talks was saying that about him um, saying that the contract talks weren't as going as well as he'd wanted to do, but he wanted to stay at the club. And then STV News put on Twitter about the fact that um, Celtic were fining him. And then I believe, I didn't see the interviews after that, but Neil Lennon confirmed that he was getting fined a week's wages for talking about club business. Aye, fair play. I think that's fair enough. Yeah, uh, yeah me as well. And I like, I like the way, I know Celtic's got their detractors and among our own support as well, the way we conduct our business, but I think it's really good. You know, I'm not saying it's the players we sign or brilliant, whatever, but I'm just talking about how it's kept out of the media and any transfer window comes up to, nobody has got a clue who we are signing. You know, right up until the day, right up until they walk through the door, nobody's got a clue and I think that's testament to everybody involved within Celtic, I think it's really good and that's the way I would like to see it because yeah. I don't read any of the media, I don't take any of the gutter press into account and they've got us connected with we actually, here's a sort of unrelated thing I, I worked for a firm years ago, right and, and we'd, we'd phone so you could, you could phone them that you wanted so there was these lines, see the phone lines and the one of the papers or whatever they would tell you, talk uh, Football gossip. I used to get them on teletext, aye. Aye, so it'd give, give you aye. Like, teletext, it'd give you like a Celtic number, right? We would phone it up for the work and we counted uh, 132 rumours of who we'd sign and they got one right. Some like one out of 132, and that was like, I don't know, the many things know like 50 pence a minute and things like that. That's like mentioned the parrot homeboys exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, that was what the parrot was running as a sideline for the ship. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, unless I have a mellow birds with Neil Lennon before the Christmas transfer window, I'm keeping my trap shut. Uh, <laughs> scooters. Chicago, where they got a big phone bill, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. But nah, they, they, I mean, these things, it's just. And, these guys in the press, let's face it, see nowadays, see with internet, do they know any more than us? No, I don't think so. It, it's it, it's the age of information, you know what I mean? Aye. Because uh, I, I don't think they do either, Joe. I think years ago, obviously, they could, we, we've, got, we've got jobs to do, so obviously we go to work and you've not got enough time to spend milling around the internet all day. But these guys are getting paid to do that, so they've got more time hunting about for information. But they're probably looking in the same places as we're looking, like message boards and things like that. I think the one difference might be, I mean, if see when you read all those things about like a source clo- close to the club or a source close to the player or a source close to the manager, right? It's family, friend. But see when you get into like, say, see if I was to go somewhere and talk to people at the FAI, there are hundreds of people I could talk to, right? There's hundreds of guys all around the place running leagues, doing different things, right? It's probably the same in any football club. There's probably hundreds of people doing different jobs. So any one of them could be a source close to the club, right? Aye. So you that's know what, as well, though, do you not think it'd be it'd be as much as much harder for journalists because because the the information is out there so everybody's got the the, the digital highway at the fingertips, if you like, right? It was much probably easier for a journalist to take a play to the side years ago and get wee bits of information. And maybe even for managers. Do you know what I mean? They were maybe getting wee kickbacks, right? Players were in the earnings so much in the 70s and the 80s and stuff like that, right? And they were maybe selling wee stories here and there. But it'd be far harder in this day and age for players and, and managers and people like that, people even working at the club, to get away with selling stories to the papers on the fly and stuff like that. Do you think that'd be a wee part of it as well? I just think it's testament to Celtic that we keep this under wraps yeah, with the media that's out there. Because obviously, Neil Lennon, Neil Lennon will be privy 
to who's coming into the club, but he'll tell nobody because Peter Law and Peter Law maybe discuss several transfer targets with him, and then he'll go and do it in his own or whatever other board member comes and does it with him. Maybe Neil Lennon is not even sure until Law phones him up. And the deal's been done, you know, because. I, I, I know some football players. I know a couple of managers and stuff like that. They, they'd never tell you anything. You wouldn't. You wouldn't ask. But did did they even know? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's the suits that pull the strings and decide who's. Maybe you're giving a list of guys you're, for positions and here's the potentials. And I don't know. But it's. I think it's testament to Celtic that they don't know this stuff and the the hacks that drives them daft. Because the same amount of rumours in that, you see when I'm walking to get a train at Central Station, the wee evening times, I look at the headline and that, it's just bullshit. Yeah, well, it's, it's most papers in that areas, I think, you know what I mean? Well, mo- well, most, you know, tabloid papers. But I mean, and mo- I, think, I think I heard that, Kelvin McKenzie, I get the text with Big Eddie, the other day, Kelvin McKenzie, is he now working with the Daily Mail? I think he's going to say he'd shot himself. Oh, that'd have been nice if you had have done. Are you joking? Is he working with the Daily Mail? Do I? I think that's right. I've checked my text here. Big Eddie texted me. Big Eddie done the show the other night. He texted me. I'll let you know that now. Hang on a wee second. I know there's a lot of people campaigning to get him off the BBC question time and stuff, you know? And why are you ever go on the, the television? I don't know. Yeah, he's, he's actually just texted me the other day. Yeah, give me a second. Yeah, Typical Scouser, here's his last text. You know him that's wanting to buy a 1967 original Celtic Lisbon programme? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Eddie. He says, uh, don't buy the Daily Mail. Kelvin McKenzie is a new columnist at Fascist Daily Mail. So I got that from uh, yesterday afternoon. Superb. That's another one off the list. I mean, see, with no, the news no, I, anyway. <laughs> I mean, you're in you're in Spain quite a lot. I mean, obviously, um, am I right in saying do Barca and uh, the fascists still have a, a daily newspaper? Uh, well, it's Marca. Sorry, that's like they've got Spain's got loads of sports newspapers. Maybe Barca have, but I'm not really in Barcelona a lot. But the the they've got daily sports newspapers there, Marca. You know, really? the, mean, the, seen, most of the I've, most of the clubs. I mean, I've seen in this day. I mean, I mean, you look at, I mean, you look at newspapers like the Metro, which is free, obviously, because most of it's advertising. But I've seen uh, Graham Wilson had had a couple of tweets with Celtic, and Celtic's now saying that the the digital programme's no longer available. I mean, with them an avenue to, to to make money, sort of thing. You know, they're, they're, I'd say I'd say I wouldn't say a weekly thing like the Celtic View, but you don't know if they could knock out a, a dynamic email every couple of days or something in, in a, a paper form, you know, just to give the Celtic fans something to read. Because as Joe's just says, there, what, what you can, all right, if you're not on Twitter or Facebook or anything, what your what your what options have Celtic fans got to actually read? I mean, what, what would you all say is a kosher paper for us to read? I don't know, I, I, but I don't know why. If you're talking about, if you're talking about football, there's no point in buying any paper. You don't, you don't, see, see for me, Stephen, you're only reading somebody else's opinion. Yeah. Right. And I can, I can. There's enough information out there for me to form my own opinion. And if I'm going to watch the games, well, every Celtic game I'll be watching in one form or the other. If it's a home game, I'll be there. Some away games I'll be there. And the ones that I'm not there, I'll be watching the TV. So I see enough there to form my own opinion of how Celtic are playing. I pick up enough snippets through various mediums. I mean, I'm. I'm not going into the debate about which Celtic website's the best, but I go on Celtic Mind, I think it's great. And the, the information I get in there for various sources with Celtic community, within the Celtic community, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Obviously, the huddle board's excellent. You'll have your Celtic Quick News, Kerrydale Street, I mean, they're your main ones. And uh, I think the, the information that's at your fingertips and for next to nothing, Celtic Mind that you pay like a tenner every couple of years or that. And the, I've had that bag a hundred times over with some of the information I've had for that site and some of the balance. Even just that, Jason, even just that, when you look about the the amount of Celtic blogs with the Lost Boys blogs, you've got Kev that runs the Celtic blog, you've got uh, the Celtic Celtic network with Jazz and that, they've got all the blogs out there. And that, as you say, a journalist is only, you're only reading the opinion of somebody who doesn't even like Celtic. I'd rather read the opinions of fellow Celtic fans. And that, that doesn't mean I'm only going to read stuff pro Celtic. That's not the case at all. We're all different. Here now, we've all got different points of views here. And you'll read loads of different points of view as well. 
Exactly, and, and you're talking about what we're talking about the now, the, where we're talking now, the medium, this Hail Hail Media Network. I mean, all the new ones that have came to the fore, like the temporary stand and the, that 90 minute cynic in the green room, these are all excellent. And obviously, yeah. you've got the, like, Graham's been here a bit longer and the, the mainstay, like Chris, for the Lost Boys. But absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And that, uh, to, to me, I love that 90 minute cynic because it was quite, it was different, you know, yeah. and it was like loads of stuff. When years ago, when I had a lot more time in my hands, I'd be playing football manager, and I would know about all these crazy players that are coming out there, and they would know all these stats for players in various countries. And uh, I just thought it was great listening to them, so I'm sort of starting to learn a wee bit. We've been joined. I really enjoyed it. We've been joined by a listener, Dara O'Shea. Dara, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Am I coming through okay, guys? Yeah, come on, you're dead yeah. on, no problem. What did you want to talk about, Dara? No, uh, well, it's just a wee thing to say. I think it's deadly what you guys are doing. I mean, I'm living down in Darlington now, and hardly anybody I know supports Celtic. And it's just the fact that you guys are online keeping folk informed as to what the crack is is fucking brilliant. Oh, she's a language and nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I just oh, realised no. I just said that. I'm like, oh, it's not it's a danger. <laughs> uh, so bleep for that one. But no, nah, seriously, it's been superb. It's just as I say, there's that much gumph that you see in the media and the papers. And I wasn't until like when I came down here because I used to live in Scotland getting the papers i'm just getting so wound up going what the feck are these guys talking about you know is this really really annoying because my time in scotland was pretty well it was great at a good time because i came over in the late 80s didn't know about celtic and when the lads from glasgow took me into the wing and told me about pat bonner and he goes oh goalie for ireland right that's my team but all my pals were hertz hibs and a couple of buns but i was a raver back then so you know i've been mean, just part in a way. Oh, but, I must know you. <laughs> Weren't they all? <laughs> Just no so, I used to run a club in Edinburgh, uh, Colton Studios. I right. was uh, Euphoria. Right. It was on a Saturday night and Adrenaline right. was on a Friday. Right. No, I was never there. I used to be a regular at the Cronk. Did you ever go to the Cronk and cow the beef? No, I, I know of the Cronk. No, but uh, it was Colton Studios. This was back in, what, 92? Yeah. I, I, I went there a few times. And 100k sound system, and my hearing's totally fecked because of it. But hey, man, it was good times. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can remember it, you weren't there. <laughs> well, I couldn't do any naughtiness because I was working. <laughs> but I always remember a guy came up to me going, Ah, oh, I got some really good eckies in that. I'm thinking, I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't want any. No, but they're really good. And I goes, You see this walkie talkie? I work here. And the boy's face just dropped. And I'm like, look, as long as in that chest, just carry on. Uh, no, hey, listen, mate, that's not the views of the panel here. They were not advocating any of this kind of oh, stuff. God, no, 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 no. Oh, God, no. Oh, God, no. All, in our, all in our sorted past. That's where it is. Aye, aye. But see, <laughs> see the point you bring up there, Dara, about um, having this for you've done in Darlington, you're saying, right, and you've not many Celtic fans to talk to. And it's, it's funny, right, I read... We post the, the links to all the podcasts and loads of different message boards and different forums and stuff like that. And it's funny. The, and everybody's entitled to an opinion, of course. It doesn't matter. It's no skin off our backs to anybody who says anything bad or say good stuff or whatever, right? But it's funny. The, the, people, the more people, the people who really, who really seem to like the podcast and love the different stuff is people like yourself and people maybe here in Ireland, and people who live in America, and people who maybe don't have the same sort of uh, Celtic network of friends where they're just going to meet them every day and work or in the pub or stuff like that. Probably the more sort of... Uh, the, the people who are maybe a wee bit more down them or the people who can say maybe live and breathe Celtic every day in their own community. And I think we probably get a lot more support for people with Glasgow, if you, if you know what I mean by that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying, I mean, obviously there's people like Jason, I mean, he's in the thicket and that and Paul and that, right? But I'm just saying, for the most part, I think people people don't realise, it's not until you move away from that sort of mentality when you live there, right? It's not It's not until like, I moved to Ireland, as I said, and I couldn't believe how little Celtic fans there were in such a big town I'm in, right? And it's not until so right. you move away that you realise how hard it is Maybe not so much now with the internet and everything, right? But a few, even just a few years back, you didn't realise how hard it was just to sit down and have a conversation with somebody about Celtic. Yeah, I, you, you're totally right. I mean, as I say, when I li lived in Edinburgh, none of my pals supported Celtic, so it was no one really to share it with. And when I came down to Darlington, there was a supporters club, 
and I started getting to go to the games and going to the European trips, and it was just phenomenal. It was just such good crack, you know. And now, I mean, after last year, well, the year before last, with all the bombs and the bullets, I went, that's it, I'm buying a season ticket. You know what I mean? I'm just going to, like, even only get to go to three times a year. You know what I mean? The way I look at it is for the cores, as they say. Yeah. And it's, just, it's, it's, it's a long journey to go up for a game because luckily I can get the like, I work in retail so I can get midweek off so I can head up on the Wednesday and that get the game and then heading back and back to work on the Thursday but so oh, I head the next okay. morning but it's totally worth it and it's just oh, it's all, the, all, the Eckies, all the Eckies just selling up and down it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I behave myself you, you have to because you know I mean the police have had to shut you down all the time and you're like you have to have totally distance yourself from all that type of stuff you're like look now to do with me at all you know by, by the way that, that, that's, it, that's the Everton game here Everton's playing Newcastle right it's one each with 10 minutes to go See in the second half Newcastle just missed a set in the second half Everton with a goal disallowed that Fellaini was a half a yard onside and then they've just scored there with the ball or the line and the refs no gave it unbelievable we've been joined by uh, we've been joined by Tommy in Glasgow Tommy you there Listen, lads, I'll hang up because I've only got 3G, so I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for talking, guys. All right, Thursday. Take it easy, mate. Cheers, cheers. Ta-da, pal. Take it easy. Tommy, you there? Hello? Are you there, Tommy? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes, no problem. What, 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 how you doing? What about you? How you doing? Good, good, good. What did you want to talk about, Tommy? Hey, did you know? Don't you know? What did you know? Don't you know? Hey, did you know? What did you know? Did you know? Did you know? Hey, did you know? What? You're joking, aren't you? Hey, you're joking. Hey, is that what's your name? Sorry, is that who was the one Jason, talking about? Jason. Oh, mate, I mean, I, I, I'm the same age as yourself. The same almost remarkable story. You just mentioned Quadrant Park earlier on. Oh, and, loved it, mate. Did you go to Quadrant Park? Aye, aye, and then Cream all the time. I, well, I, I mean, well, Cream came after when the time I was bouncing about there, like not job, but the, the Quadrant Park, I remember that. They, they had a part that was open to about two in the morning. It was on kind of three different levels, like a nightclub, and then it opened a big warehouse about two in the morning. And I remember ah. one, one time there as I was dancing off my tits in an ecky. <laughs> 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 this is the view of the panel here. <laughs> That's, that's panel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, about the, the quadrant part and the ball, Mick Cutnell bounces passes with a big cheesy grim. And I'm like, ah, this is pure surreal. I'm sitting, I'm bouncing about in a nightclub in Liverpool and Mick Cutnell from Symphony Red, Red is grinning like a chess air cat, giving yeah, it, mean, let's go, let's go. Ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> that's my bad. Oh. Oh, heavy days, Tommy. Brilliant days. Well, we were good. And I, I knew some scousers in uh, over the, over the period. And say they were under. They're, the, they're they're just the same as same as us. Now I mean, they're the, they're, they're just uh, Scots who managed to steal a pair of trainers out of uh, John Lewis's windy windy, and they, and they, they marched it down to 250 miles. Now I mean, so they're cut of the same cloth. The Irish got the same boats over to Liverpool, and to see the injustice that was visited upon the whole city of Liverpool uh, on the last 23 years. I remember I got off, or I was I was heading down uh, to London when I was just 17 uh, to go and see one of my aunties, and I stopped by uh, Liverpool, leaving at Lime Street, and this was in 1990, just about six months after the, the disaster. Right. And I was about to buy uh, a, a, a scum newspaper, and as I was buying it in the middle of Lightning Street, just came down to London. I said, I'd left Glasgow a month before my 18th birthday. This is me going to his thing, mate. Stopped in to see a couple of mates, a few mates who I'd went to college with. And they were like, yeah, lad, don't buy that, don't buy that. And I'm standing there like that. And the, the guy in the cell in the paper says, listen to your mates, kid, don't buy it. And I was like, aye. I was like, tell me about it. And that was the first time they said, well, this is what was said and this is what they did, you know, to Liverpool. And from that point onwards, and the astonishing, you know, solidarity for the Liverpool people that they've had, you know, and for what happened. Absolutely. I, I view that as a crime against the city of Liverpool, similar to how the Irish were portrayed in the media, you know, and, and Thatcher and her friends. And we, we see how the closeness with Murdoch 
and prime ministers are, and we can see the relationship with the police. And that hasn't just been in the last few years that Levis has been finding about. This has been going on. This is a totalitarian system. And the full weight of this uh, uh, police state has fell upon Liverpool, just as it did to the Irish. And the way the, the, the character assassinated Liverpool uh, over that period, and to see some truth finally happening, and now, God willing, the justice part will come. It might take another 20 or 20 years. God hoping it's not. But the justice part for the 96, surely to God, is going to come because it's out there now and the people of Liverpool have been vindicated uh, for, for what's happened. And, you know, God bless the people of Liverpool and, and God bless, uh, you know, the people who died that day because it was a sad, sad, sad day. Well said, Tommy. Well said. And I know... I know I mean, you yourself, I'm not being disrespectful here, but a lot of people think you're a, you're a mental patient. <laughs> but, uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's the nicest possible way, mate. But no, you, you speak absolute sense here. And, and see, when you say a police state, and see, to a certain extent, it actually was. And it was this went back for the minor strike. Because uh, obviously Thatcher, the South Yorkshire police, they were her stormtroopers. So she couldn't see them uh, getting pulled up in front of whatever panels or whatever was was available back then but she was fully behind that cover up and that cover up went right to the top that was that, that she was involved in that cover up nothing sure and uh, oh, yeah. see to be honest with you as soon as that support came out why did the chief superintendent of the south yorkshire police not visit the ex-chief superintendent of south yorkshire police arrest him and put him in uh, put him in prison and in remand and waiting till his trial comes up because these these police officers should be jailed because the thing that they've managed to, and, and how they've managed to do it is that for the police, they've got this uh, code where they don't break ranks. To break ranks is a, a treachery. Aye. The old thing is, you know, it's not, you know, it's a crime to, to get caught. It's not actually doing a crime. And then the police, you know, this is, uh, uh, crime does pay. When it comes from an organised state, uh, like the government, uh, like the you know, they're the biggest terrorists, they're the biggest gangsters, the biggest drug people who, who make more from drugs in this country, from illegal and uh, illegal, st illegal stuff, you know, from they're, they're the biggest, the government and, and the, the fascist state that, that sits there, you know, all sitting there, all joined together from the police, uh, from your politicians uh, and your journalists covering it all up. And the full force of that police state landed in the door of Liverpool. And it was, it was a cover up, I mean, from Thatcher. Uh, to visit there next week, but and for her puppy, uh, or, or, you know, or, I don't know who was a lap dog, but she was a lap dog for her mother, or he was it for her. But they, they were all aligned together to to bring this on Liverpool, and I, 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 I cried buckets when I heard some of the stuff. You know, and a lot of stuff wasn't new. If you, if you analysed it, a lot of the stuff about the police statements. I remember watching a documentary. God, maybe about a decade ago, how they scored it all out. So a lot of the information, uh, w w you know, w was w was already out there. But the key thing was that a prime minister stood there and apologised and, and stated the most important thing was to clear the name of the Liverpool fans and clear the names of Liverpool That was Exactly, first, mate. It was, it was the most clearest thing that came out to me, that Liverpool fans were exonerated. Liverpool fans were exonerated. They did not do anything that was said. And the real truth finally came out. Now, as I say, it's about the justice and doubling the efforts for all the... I'm doing an interview, God willing, later on with a good brother from the Hillsborough Justice Campaign. Uh, and, and, and these people, you know, the, 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 the police officers, uh, the Duckingworth, or whatever it's called, and these people should be in jail. You know, if they can chase uh, Nazi Holocaust, you know, uh, would you call it, stormtroopers or whatever, Nazi guards or whatever, then they should be chasing these people. They should be, just because of the police or just because they worked in the media, Kelvin McKenzie, so for his lies, and, and I don't scumbag. believe... Scumbag. I don't believe that, that that scumbag's lies that he stated or, 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 you know, the excuse that they gave, it came from, you know, a politician. Nonsense. This was a script organised by Murdoch and McKenzie and Thatcher and the police sitting there concocting it saying, OK... We, I, I would go as far as saying they, they made that happen. That's how far, that's how bad and evil and twisted that evil 
bastard down there that Thatcher is and the people around her. That's how evil and twisted we can see what they did to the Irish community over a sustained period, how evil and twisted they treated the Irish hunger strikers and, and many other, you know, atrocious they're pure evil personified, you know, they're, they're the biggest terrorist drug narco banking cabalist bastards that have to have their lips <laughs> drawn upon them because this evil should not be allowed to exist and I, I feel totally cleansed for, for what happened there last week for a, a bit of justification you know for for standing beside our good brothers in Liverpool you'll never walk alone hail hail God bless I'm off bros and uh, keep the peace and keep 3 0 victory Wednesday night there you go Tommy top man Tommy we, 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 love, to we love it when you come on you always, you always just you, you wrap everything up so well fair play to you mate thanks very much I'll dash away because I don't want to take up your show okay? I'm preparing this. I'm going to do a wee interview later on. What time you finish at half ten, aye? We're going to finish now. I think I've got to go to bed. <laughs> well, carry on. I'm, I'll be doing my stuff later on. I'm doing a, f- a few wee live shows. And God willing, I spoke to you a, 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 a some earlier on and hopefully I've got something lined up in the pipe. Well, I can't say anything now, but I'm feeling... The reason why I'm talking 100 mile an hour because I've just got off a call and I've been given a wee ray of hope, something big. So hopefully I'm in on it. Keep doing our up and see you later. God bless. Hail, hail. Tap on. Hail, hail. Take it easy. Um, um, Dara, anything you want to add before we wrap up, man? Uh, no, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know what to say really. Just, I'm just so chuffed you're doing what you're doing, and it's a phenomenal job. And I'm forever trying to spread the news about what you guys are doing. It's just a top, top job. It's superb. And I just coming home from work, if I'm on my phone listening in when you're on, it's, it's great. And in the mornings, downloading if I don't get to hear it, to going to work, it's just. Information is phenomenal, and I'm dyslexic, so reading is not my best forte, you know. So, and having you guys talking about it is superb. And see those books you're doing. If you do an audio version of it, because I'm pretty sure there's quite a few like myself and and folk who are blind can hear the news. Like, I really look forward to the books coming out. You know, is and it's Paul Larkin's books. Yeah, it's, it's just it's just deadly what you all doing. See, um, Paul, like, Paul is actually Paul. I'm sorry to cut in on you, but um, he's recorded Paul, something. Has he? Paul is. He Paul has started recording and um, and looking at the, the releasing his books as audio books. So um, watch this space. But I think those will be coming soon. Oh, that'd be deadly. Because it was actually a, it was actually somebody who's a, who's. A he's got some. He's, he's got some at old. the minute, Dara. He's got some at the minute. See if you go into the Hill Hill Media page. It's only it's got- access though. Yeah, yeah, I've heard them. They're really good. That's just that was him playing around with the idea to see how it would work for him. Uh, But he is going to do the books in their entirety uh, through the through. I mean, he's still wrapping up that book. He's got a new book coming out around about Halloween. I think I'm going to be formatting it from this week. And uh, once he's kind of cleared the decks, I think that's when he's going to sit down and get the stuff recorded for the audiobooks. So uh, no, it's definitely something because I, I was actually a blind Celtic fan, as you, as you mentioned there. I was a blind Celtic fan that had approached him who was really interested in, in hearing his stuff. So no, that's, that's definitely going to be coming. See, that's what it's all about. I mean, stuff like that. I mean, yeah. people well, do. They're going to be 50 quid a copy like that. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll be able to do a wee bit business, a wee bit deal, you know what I mean? A wee bit this and that for a bit this and that. No. <laughs> uh, no, definitely. Yeah, I'll be, be definitely there out to push that and the help. Oh, well, you've been a pusher. Triple <laughs> <laughs> <Never fly. laughs> Got the next, Mayfield experience. Next time you're going. By the way, I have to say, I love your uh, avatar there, the Buddy Christ. Aye. Uh, what have you got? He's got <laughs> me, and, me and Joe are big fans of Ken Smith's work, so. Ah, uh, he's super. He does a couple of podcasts himself as well. I listen to just to the oil them to be honest with you. It's it's really really good. It's just nice to listen to this the banter they talk about. It's just superb. And as I say, it's just, just over the moon you guys are doing what you're doing, and it makes my life so much easier to, to get information. And then the other people are going, so we haven't got time to read. Just listen to it. It's just the, they hear about the Celtic story and about different fans' perspectives, and I love hearing about your, your experiences in football over the years. As I say. I'm pretty new because when I was at group in, in Dublin, I wasn't really into football at all. I remember folk having like man new bags, Liverpool bags, and I'm thinking, well, I'm Irish. I don't want to support any of those teams. I've got no affiliation with it. And then when I came across Celtic, it was like, Jesus, this is deadly. And then the history and how 
they love to celebrate the Irishness. You know what I mean? And for me, being from Ireland, it's like a whole way from home. And when I went away to Europe, it was just all the songs and the crack. It was just like being in the race scene. Everyone was all loved up, looking at each other, having a good crack, no trouble. And it's just a, a phenomenal experience. And I'm getting one of my nephews to get on a European trip. And I goes, look, you got to come because once you go there, you get the bug and you, you get to, you meet all the people. It's all one big happy family and everyone's there together. And it's just superb. It really is. And I'm just so happy to be a part of this family, you know. And it's, it's just... It's, it's just funny you say that. That's how, that. that's how we spread the gospel. We said, it, we said that in the last show. In fact, I think it was the Australian show I'd done. We were talking about the sort of how they build the fan base in America, in Australia. But it's exactly what you're saying there. You get a new you get a new fan who's new to it. You take him to one of these European trips and he gets to see the, the fans in action, the crack, the buzz, the camaraderie and all that kind of stuff. And that's how we, that's how we build the support. Aye, for sure. It is, it's deadly. I think, that's uh, a, I think that's a good note to go on, lads. Words, mate. Yep. I think it is. Uh, we're going to play out as usual with uh, our charity song. A boy, please buy it. All money goes to York Hill Hospital for sick kids. Please tell your friends to buy it. Even if you don't like it, buy it anyway. Um, and that's it for us this week. Homeboys will be back next week and uh, hopefully we'll have a good result to talk about. Two good results to talk Can about. I just, I'm going to finish it. Oh, you go ahead. Then. Just, um, I should be doing a live show this Friday at 11 a.m. Celtic Park time, just in case anybody missed that earlier. And it'll be a sort of Australian uh, more themed about just sort of it's the thing. So the guys in Australia, I think it's eight o'clock or seven, seven or eight o'clock at night in Melbourne. It's eleven o'clock in the morning here. So we're going to do that once a fortnight. Although, hopefully, and I say this for my own selfish uh, reasons, hopefully this will be the last chance I'll get to do it because um, I'm waiting to hear about a job. But this Friday, definitely eleven a.m. Celtic part time of the live show. And it'll be good because we'll get all the the chat for the Benfica game and that, and I'll have the I'll have Prefontaine and uh, Callum on in Australia, and maybe Paul will join in. I don't know, but uh, so we'll have that on Friday morning anyway. So you can tune in for that live. We we'll get the podcast. Just uh, just tell us how you ended up after the last one. <laughs> how, I, how I ended up? Yeah, I was yeah. well impressed. They still stayed up and watched the baseball. Oh, I've seen half of it. Um, no, I just. Ah, just one of the days where you just thought, ah, just go for it. I'm starting drinking now. No point in stopping. And I went, I went on a wee bend and some of that. But I paced myself. I didn't have that much to drink. I had a ten pint and a bottle of wine and a couple of halves. But... Can I say a wee tip for you? Yeah. The hangover cure is yeah. an oxygen cube of hot water. I tell you that is the best medicine for a hangover. Really? Someone told me, ah, seriously, someone told me, told me this a couple of years ago and I'm thinking, nah, you're taking the piss here. And I was really bad one day. I mean, you no, know, you get the sickly feeling, the sore head, and it's like, oh man, I'm dying here. And I goes, feck it, I'll give this a try. And seriously, within two hours, it was like, Jesus, I feel great. I'm knackered, but I don't have the sore head or the sickly feeling. So I swear to God, Oxycube hot water for a hangover does the damage. Trust me on this one, my friends. See, I just deadly. I'll be away for a 16 pack. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I go on holiday, you know, or I'm going away a trip, always pack oxygen suits. <laughs> people oh. think people think you're smuggling hash. Uh, I, just <laughs> pack, I, I, I just pack euros to get me a swallow. <laughs> See, I, I have that as well, but I, you know, I officer, I officer, this is oxo cubes. <laughs> <laughs> you may be laughing, but when you have a hangover, you say what you can chase. It's like I was right. It is. It's, it hey, works. We got we got another parrot. We've got another one. <laughs> <laughs> is that fair? <laughs> right. Listen, that's us done. Cheers, lads. We'll talk to you next week. All right. All right God all bless all. Take it easy. God bless. Thanks. Glasgow Street, a young boy in torn clothes has a ball at his feet. He shouts, Daddy, I'll play for Celtic. I'm gonna be a superstar. He says, Go out there and get it, son. Show the jungle who you are. 
Daddy, I'll be a striker. I'll be deadly round the box. I'll win the treble, conquer Europe, and score the winner right at Ibrox. rocks. He was a boy. And he'd always wanted to be a boy. He was a boy. And he'd always wanted to be a boy. He goes pushing through the turnstiles with the old man by his side. He hears stories of Brother Walford and the day John Thompson died. Of Tully and of Johnson and of Caesar and Jack Steen. And being captain in the hut would always be his childhood dream. But time had moved so quickly and his dreams are way back when. And the old man seats it's empty. They say he died, stop in the tent. He was a boy. He'd always wanted to be a boy. He was a boy. He'd always wanted to be a boy. Now his own son stands beside him. And among the sea of green, he shows promise with the football, and he grows to live the dream. Come his granddad's anniversary, he's Captain Darby Day. He issues orders to the huddle, wearing the number of McStay. The crowd they roar around him as the ball comes to his feet. He drops a shoulder like McCord, only the keeper now to be. Runs to the old jungle, his finger pointing to the skies. Pumps his fist towards an old man, and there's tears in both their eyes. Now he's a boy. Cause he'd always wanted to be a boy. He was a boy. He always wanted to be a boy. Like Tommy Burns and Big Roll He only wanted to be a boy Thank you.